You know what? Hi, good evening, everybody. Please can I welcome everybody to this rescheduled meeting of the Health and Environment Policy Committee taking place from the Walton Suite, Winchester Guildhall, time 6.30. My name is Councillor Brian Laming, Chairperson of this meeting. The meeting is audio recorded, live streamed, and will be available on the Council's YouTube channel. Subtitles are available. Advice on how to turn this on set out in our website. If you're joining us online, please turn your camera and microphone off until your item. And everyone, please ensure mobile phones are on silent. Lastly, can I please remind members to use their microphones and speak directly into them. Please do not turn away when speaking to enable your comments to be picked up and recorded for the meeting. In the unlikely event that it is necessary to evacuate the building, the fire alarm will sound. Please follow all the instructions given to you by our team. And I welcome members of the public to the meeting and we will invite you forward and when it's time for you to make your contribution. Yeah. Apologies for absence. Thank you, Chair. Apologies, apologies for absence received from Councillor Clear. Thank you. And Deputy? I haven't got one present at the moment, okay. Chair. Uh, we now need to elect a vice chairman because Andrew is not available today. Okay. Just, for yeah, just for tonight's meeting. Uh, I would like to propose uh, Councillor Westwood. Do I have a second? Okay. Do, do we have any other nominations? Everybody agreed? Thank you. If you'd like to come up. Uh, declarations of interest. Do we have any? Uh, announce Chairman's announcements. I'd like to welcome uh, Brian Jackson from the Freeport Association. Um, unfortunately, we haven't heard from Southern Water, but I will ask if you can uh, chase those up for me. We have heard, but it was too late for this meeting, but they've accepted your invitation to the next meeting. Oh, lovely, thank you. Minutes for the last meeting. Do we have any questions on those? Amendment? All those? Do we agree those? Thank you. Right. Right. Thank you. Um, Chris Holloway, would you like to speak at your item rather than before we start? Well, we'll do it in front of the item. I think that's a more sensible way of doing it. Thank you. Right, I'd like to invite uh, Mr Johnson to give his little presentation on the free ports for us and how they're liable to affect Winchester. Thank you. And is that coming across loud and clear? Good. Uh, yes, thank you for that. And thank you very much, Councillor, and all of you for the invitation to come and speak this evening. Um, my name is Brian Johnson. I'm chair of the Solon Freeport Consortium. Uh, before that, I was chair of the Solon Local Enterprise Partnership. I did both jobs for a while, but, but chose to move forward with the Freeport. Um, I think it's worth me just talking for about a minute about what free ports are in terms of the English legislation, because it, it, there have been free ports before, there are lots of free ports around the world, and, and the phrase in itself is not necessarily descriptive of what the current legislation is in the UK. So uh, about two years ago, the government invited regions to bid for free ports. And in this context, free ports are made up of two aspects, which is custom sites, which in broad terms is making ports more efficient, and tax sites, 
which are very like what we would have known as enterprise zones. So the reason the, the Solent bid for this was because it was a clear chunk of, uh, to use that phrase, leveling up money that the government were giving out. So it, it was a key policy in terms of regional aid. And we felt that if we didn't do it, particularly with our ports being such a significant part of our area, we would be left behind in terms of that investment. So the local enterprise partnership were asked to come together and coordinate a bid for the region. Free ports, the government were looking for them to be an intervention at scale. So you had to find in your tax sites between 400 and 600 hectares of land to be able to bid. Quite apart from the economic advantage you were given, if you didn't get that much land, you weren't going to get through. And, and we all live and work in this region, and you'll understand that it's quite hard to stitch together that much land in one place, particularly because it all had to be within a 45 kilometer diameter circle in, in the original legislation, and you were only allowed three discrete tax sites. So we, we the LEP, invited uh, and where we are now is our bid was successful for the region. Um, we have carried on um, government's business case. Uh, we are very close to being finally approved. Our business case has been approved. And we are now in the position of having uh, um, one custom site approved, which is Solent Gateway, the old Marchwood and Portsmouth International Port is also planning to be uh, a custom site. The Port of Southampton probably isn't at the moment because as the legislation developed, it turned out that container ports weren't really the right place to be custom sites. But the importance for the region is about these tax sites. So we have three tax sites in the region. Um, Dunsbury Farm, um, uh, north of Portsmouth, which is a slightly complicated site from a local authority point of view because it's actually owned by Portsmouth Council. Rating authorities haven't, as I'm sure you are aware. And the second site is the Navigator Quarter, so not far from here at all, which is the north end of the airport and the, some of the old railway yards in East Lee. I'm sure all of you who live and work around here are aware that that, that, that particular area has needed some investment to free it up for to, to be a more productive employment site for some time. Then the third site is the Southampton Waterside site, which is actually made up of about five discrete sites because we persuaded the Treasury that, that it could be one site because the bits that join it up are SSIs or bits of the National Park or other complex bits of water. So it's the end of Southampton Port. Uh, it is uh, Selink Gateway is um, what ABP now calls Strategic Land Reserve, which was Dibden Bay a few years ago. It is some land released in the oil refinery, and then his Forley Waterside, the development where the power station used to be. So these tax sites, the, the, the advantage for the region is that employers setting up there get six different tax breaks. I, I won't list them, but they're better than enterprise zones. So if you're setting up a, uh, a new company, would be very incentivized to do it there. So it should bring new jobs to the region. We, we estimate over the sort of 25 years, 16,000 new jobs created here, another 16,000 created, sorry, 16,000 created in the tax sites and another 16,000 created in the area around that. that. Um, but the other part of it is that the business rates, which would be generated, um, get retained and can be spent for economic progress in the region. And the estimate over the 25 years of the Freeport is those business rates will be somewhere between four and 500 million. And the, the Freeport board is responsible for reallocating those. As I said earlier, I am independent chair. I have been appointed officially through a, a transparent interview process and approved by the uh, cabinet office. We also have all of the rating authorities represented, which for us is uh, Havant and Eastleigh and Southampton and New Forest are on there. We also have Hampshire represented because they're the highways authority. We have the custom site owners, that's Solent Gateway and Portsmouth Port. And at the moment, the government only allowed us 12 board members on the free boards. Um, part of our request in the business case was to increase that to 16 because at the moment, I'm the only independent director. 
and, and quite apart from it being a free port and dealing with public money, as I'm sure some of you know, a, a company with only one independent director is not a very stable board. So the, the final part of legislation I talked earlier about, it had to be within a 45 kilometer diameter circle. And if you imagine those tax sites I described and putting a map on there and moving it to fit best, it caused some confusion because, of course, it, it, of course it cut across communities. I mean, I give the example, Minstead in the New Forest, it ran straight to the middle of that. It cut off bits of the Isle of Wight. So in discussion with the government, the outer boundary has been changed to a, an area that we could specify of the same land area, which those of you at my age who did O-level maths rather than GCSE will know it's about 1,500 square kilometers. So we've redrawn the outer boundary to be more sensibly geographically, politically, and economically. So it is very roughly the Solent LEP area. So it's sort of all of New Forest District Council, all across, you know, bounded to the north by the M27 and across to uh, Hailing Island and Havant, and including the Isle of Wight. But crucially, we also extended it up the M3 to Junction 9 because as I'm sure you all understand, the interconnectivity of that to the port is crucial. And the significance of this outer boundary is that four or 500 million of retained rates can be spent within that outer boundary. Now, I have to say that the government haven't been precise finally about legislation. So whether it literally means when you get to that outer boundary, you can spend it on one side of the road and not the other, or whether if the board feel it has an impact on the region, we can spend it. I think that's probably more likely. So for instance, what it would mean for you is the, is the employment sites around the M3 probably will be allowed to be used in that retained rates. But I think for, for Winchester, the key thing is that we're generating a lot of jobs in this region. Uh, it is likely that some of your land will ben can benefit from those retained rates. And, the, and the, the, the jobs and retained rates generated in the region will be really good for, for all of you. Um, so as you know, as you can probably tell, I can talk for a long time, but I'll stop there and uh, ask questions. I'll go for questions if that's okay. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, firstly, thank you for coming to, jumping in a bit ahead of Brian, but thank you for coming to talk to the Winchester Council. We really appreciate it. Um, as you're aware, there are a lot of differing views about free ports and their economic impact uh, that's happening beyond these walls, and something we don't have time to cover today. Um, however, two issues I would like to raise and that I'm hoping you'll be able to answer are, uh, are on planning and traffic. Um, firstly, on planning, free ports essentially do away with a lot of planning, a lot of the planning process. And therefore, there is a significant risk of development happening that is contrary to normal processes. Uh, in other words, outside the normal community standards as set by the local plan. Are there any developments that the council should be aware of, for example, on the uh, Greenfield site beside Southampton Airport? And what is Solent Freeport doing to ensure that any developments are occurring to appropriate standards? That's my first question. And secondly, what is the anticipated traffic impact from the new Freeport? Um, how will this affect traffic on the M3 past Winchester and what steps are being taken to mitigate the carbon impact given that we are in the climate emergency? Thank you. Thank you. I'll talk to the microphone, so the temptation to talk to you is, uh, is great. Um, uh, good, good questions, and um, I, I paused simply because you could answer half, a half an hour on, on both of your two points. Uh, so on the first one is um, where tax sites have been declared, and the tax sites are public domain, you can look on the government website because they had to go through an act of parliament. The, there has been... Um, a site-specific agreement signed between the Freeport Board, the Rating Authority, and the landowner. And 
if the developments um, that they're doing, and, and I'll come to planning specifically in a minute, but if the developments they're doing or the employer is not seen as fitting the priorities of the Freeport or the region, and the most obvious example of that would be displacement. You know, what we don't want is somebody moving a mile down the road just to get tax breaks. If they don't make those things, then they, the, the site-specific agreement means that the rating authority will not grant them the, the, the rate, the, the, not just the rating breaks, but the tax breaks that go within that, that, that limit. So it's interesting that the landowners have, it, on the one hand, you'd say they've got a benefit out of becoming a tax site, but the agreement they've had to sign to be one has got teeth. They, they cannot do things unless it's approved. And going back to your specific point on planning, I, I would confess I'm not a planning expert, but uh, we have the leaders of all those councils on the board, um, and they are satisfied actually that the Freeport legislation itself does not really change the planning situation. It got confused because of the government's uh, discussion about enterprise zones, uh, sorry, investment zones that happened in the last two months and came and went, as I'm sure you're aware which they imply different things. But where we are in the tax sites is the, the planning authorities have not changed. The, the Freeport Board does not have any planning responsibility. It's still, it's still the, the, the rating authority or the planning authority for that region, which would tend to be the same thing. Um, in terms of traffic, I didn't talk, because again, it's a subject for another hour, but it is easy to assume that when I talked about retained rates, that we'd be spending those on, on bridges or, or carriageways or bypasses. In fact, if you look at what we've put in the business case, we've allocated um, the majority of that money on other things. So there is some infrastructure. So if you, if you look at uh, the Navigator Quarter, we all know that the, the current bridge over the railway is a limit to that site's expansion. But we have put 20% of the money into skills and training because if we're going to create jobs, we want local people to get them. So we want to make sure that the colleges get the right skills in there. And we have put a, a significant amount of money into green development. So we would absolutely see that, that what we do will be green. And, it, and indeed, I, I, we talked about the Port of Southampton. One of the reasons that, that we're working with them is because the time they spent working on the railway and, and in my other the job I was in with the LEP, as you probably know, we've helped the Port of Southampton work with some of their railway access, with some of their ground power. So I, uh, again, I'm not a traffic expert, but I would be very disappointed if we saw this creating more traffic. I think the, the Freeport has to be sustainable. I mean, all business anyone does has to be sustainable. It's, it's clear to me, and I think it's clear to the board. But I, I don't want to be evasive of the answers. I'm very happy to take away and get some of the staff to come back with, with specific numbers because in the business case, um, we have modeled all of these things so we can give specific answers. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Cook, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you once again for your time here this evening and presented to us so far. I'd like to come back to the tax sites, if I may. Um, you referred to the one that is in, in Eastleigh, which is, and you referred to the railway yard. Yes. And in the last week, and, and I'm coming to where we are with highways, back to highways again, um, the um, story of, you said how important the Junction 9 is for the connectivity, but there's also a very, another very important area as well part of that railway yard, chicken hauls, work that's carrying on there at this moment in time. So perhaps you could give us, as a committee here this evening, some indication of what um, is being planned for the railway yard, and is there any truth behind the readmission of the chicken hall slip road, which would really, there's no doubt it would help immensely. Thank you. Um, just in, in an introductory answer, um, one of the strengths of the Solent Freeport is that unlike some of the other, the, the, the Freeport that's most notable is the one on Teesside, and there's one chunk of land 
which is a very similar piece. It's very similar access. It's all owned by a metro mayor, and it's, it's one sort of monolithic offering. One of the advantages we've got here is, is geographically different and hence economically different places. You know, so if you want to be in Maritime, you might go at Foley Waterside. If you want access, you'd, you'd be in Eastleigh. But also, our sites clearly are going to develop at different speeds. So um, you, you take Dunsbury Farm, and any of you who've been there will know it's basically ready to go. There is no doubt that the site in the Navigator Quarter needs significant investment. And as I'm sure you probably modeled better than I, the, the access issues there would quickly eat up my four or 500 million pounds of retained rates. So we have been and are continuing to talk to government about, but firstly, we'd like to see that those rates are, you know, that that money's not just spent in itself, it's match funded or better, you know, by private investors. So hopefully if we spend 400 million, the impact to the area will be at least a billion. But it seems pretty clear to us that alone we can't fix the access to um, to that site. Whether it's Chicken Hall Lane, whether it's a different bridge, whether it's railway, I I think I'd leave to Eastleigh because they've been planning it for some time. But we are very conscious of it, and and it's not a simple answer. And I'm sorry not to be able to give you a, a specific answer, but we would like to encourage um, ministers to understand that that site if it needs unlocking, it's probably out with the finances of our region, my ass assumption, whether it's the Freeport, the various councils or whatever. Thank you. Councillor Warwick. Thank you very much, Chairman. I just wondered, I had a visit recently um, to the port and, and we, were, we were asking about the challenges of rail freight, railway line that goes uh -huh. straight into the port. Quite nice if you could explain for my colleagues the challenges buying into the freight, changing the freight timetabling network so, rail. I think that is quite an interesting. So, um, Southampton Port, um, for those of you who aren't aware, or people imagine our East Coast ports are the biggest ports, and they are in terms of strict tonnage, but in terms of exporting Southampton is the UK export port, because most of our exports uh, go outside of the EU. And, and when the government talk about the Midlands Engine and Northern Powerhouse, in practice, the exporting is done out of Southampton. You know, it's, it, that's why BMW picked Southampton to be their global logistics hub for that reason. As a number of you will know, and this, is, this predates the LEP or the Freeport, there has been, uh, and I'm looking, you might know better, but a, a probably multi-decade plan to free up so that containers can go on freight trains into Southampton Port. They've been lowering tunnels in Southampton, raising bridges. Uh, the, the underpass in Reading, yes, it's freed up passenger, but it's also been about freight. But you're absolutely right that the, the issue is that the lines into Southampton are, are full of trains and scheduling it is difficult. But you'll have seen just last week that uh, um, ABP and DP World announced an investment which they thought was going to take, uh, I think, the number 1,200 um, lorries a month off the motorway by opening the port. So we see opening that rail freight into the port as absolutely key. And and I think, you know, you'll notice where our outer boundary goes. We did it around the motorway because you have to draw it somewhere. And to be honest, 1,500 square kilometres was quite difficult particularly because our area has, as you will know, complex um, political boundaries. You know, so, so bits of Winchester go south of the M27, I think, doesn't it? Which people who didn't live here wouldn't immediately understand. So we have a challenge of drawing something that, that fits the area and, and also fits the economy and the politics and the geography. And uh, we've tried, and I go back to my point, that hopefully we'll be, the government will allow us to be flexible about you're not, you don't really mean one side of the road or the other. So I, I see that rail access into the port as, as a key part of, you know, this predates the Freeport. This is part of Southampton's strategic plan. And, and actually, if you want to know more about this, my, my colleague on the, LE, on the Freeport board, Alistair Welsh, who runs the port of Southampton, I, I give the overview. He can give you the full three hours on this. Thank you. Councillor Pearson. Thank you, Chair. Yes, I've uh, got three questions by May. 
Uh, don't think they're very long, however. Uh, first, there are two laps in the area, the M3 lap and the mm -hmm. Solent lap. What has happened to them? Are they being absorbed into the Freeport organisation or are they still staying separate? No, they're, so LEPs are, are different to Freeports and, and you'll have seen that the, the white paper that was issued last year suggested that areas that had elect, elected mayors and metro mayors, the LEPs would be absorbed into the economic development of that county. But because at the moment Hampshire hasn't got a county, two LEPs uh, continue. I think, and, and I'm not on the LEP board anymore, but I've worked closely with both of them. They are, are not currently getting the capital funding that they did in the past. And so, yes, they've got, but both EM3 and the Solent have got money that they've recycled in a way by doing loans. But the sort of capital funding that you've seen LEP spend in the past to do significant things is not currently the way the government's funding regional development. They're doing it through city deals and county deals and the leveling up white papers and those those type of things. Very much like watch this space, doesn't it? Um, yeah, I, I mean, it's why we felt we had to apply for a free port because it, 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 you know, it's the government allocating a chunk of capital to a region. And if we hadn't got one, we wouldn't have got it. So it's why we felt the region needed to do it. Uh, second question, a bit more contentious. One of the uh, pollution issues in Southampton is that ships have to keep their generators mm -hmm. going because there's not enough power within the uh, Solent Unitary mm -hmm. area. Um, are you proposing a new power station to uh, reduce that pollution? Um, that's not one of our plans. I mean, let me be clear that a bit like the LEPs, I can't, free ports will probably not money spender. So a free port would not build a power station or however we're going to generate electricity. Right. If somebody came to us with a proposition and said, we've seen a way of getting green power into the port of Southampton, but it needs unlocking because there's some infrastructure issue and, and they applied to the free port for a grant, then that's the kind of thing we would consider. But uh, I should declare my hand that I, I'm, a, I'm a shipbuilder in my day job so I, I you get me on ships and I, I know a fair bit about it we the, the LEP and when I was chair paid for the shore power for two of the terminals in Southampton which which are fantastic but as you quite rightly say the problem is power in the region I mean it's not a trivial thing to, to put down shore power in for a warship infrastructure for each ship is about a million you yeah. because this is a big tramp you know it's not just a plug the, 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 you the, to increase the amount of shipping that yeah, follows the, a moment like the, more pollution? I, I work in the naval base in Portsmouth and the, the, we have put in the ability to put shore power for the aircraft carriers. But the, the units they plug into which translate power from the mains in power that a ship can use is yeah. about twice the size of this room. So yeah. it, it's not a trivial engineering issue but because you're quite right to identify <coughs> it's power in the region is the, is the crucial issue. Yeah, yeah, I recognise that. I was just, hope, again, fingers crossed and hoping. Uh, last question is, I, my count, I think this must be about the third iteration of a free port. First by Buchanan in the 1960s, uh, which was thrown out because it was deemed to be pushed forward by private industry. Mm -hmm. And the second one must be about 10 years ago. Now yourselves coming forward. So what is different? And you're obviously full of hope, <laughs> which I can understand, uh, but what is, what is different now for, from certainly the last time, never mind Buchanan, because that was really was thrown out when it was still in nativity stage. So, so the three ports last time round were about ports. So you, you remember I said at the beginning that it's about making the ports act more efficiently. Um, actually, the, the custom sites benefits are quite complicated and not as, as clear cut as they might seem to be. The tax site benefits are. So, so what's happened is that in under the umbrella phase of free ports, they've combined what was the free port policy as in making ports operate more sensibly with customs and the, the enterprise zone uh, ideas. So what we are really is a combination of, of, of what free ports were, which is custom sites, and what enterprise zones were, 
and that's been put together in one thing. So the the the, the phrase Freeport, and I, and I wouldn't possibly want to question because it's the, the Prime Minister's favourite subject, but the current use of the phrase Freeport is a very loose summary of what the legislation in England actually is, which is why I, I took pains to explain that, and, and also shouldn't be shouldn't be confused with other free ports around the world. I mean, people talk to me about Luxembourg and Dubai and things, and they they use the phrase free port to, to summarize it. But like I mean, you all deal with legislation, you actually have to read what it really means. So in summary, it's the inclusion of what would have been called enterprise zones in the policy that's made the difference. Thank you. Sorry, Ed. Yeah, yeah. So the difference in T-Sport really is that they've only got one custom site and one tax site because they've got they, they could create 500 hectares of land, which we all understand our geography just means it's it's not feasible here. So it's been for all many of the other free ports, and there's one in Plymouth and South Devon, which is quite similar to us in terms of the fact they've got city, they've got a military port, they've got a national park, they've got you know very um, old county towns in the way that this is next to it, and they've had to stitch together land in the same way. So, so people talk about Teesside because it's the one that the government visits a lot, but actually most of the other seven free ports have been put together much more like we've done, which is, which is putting together sensible parcels of land. Uh, sorry, I, I should add, we have also tried to pick tax sites that are near areas which, um, to use the phrase, have got you know, left behind communities. Waterside is not as prosperous as the rest of our region. Bits of Havant are not as prosperous as the rest of our region. And so we, we have given some priority into areas where creation of employment would be a good thing. Thank you. Councillor Pearson, yeah. microphone, please. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Jackson, thank you very much for coming today. It's been very enlightening and we appreciate your time. Uh, thank you very much. Always happy to come back. And if we want to talk about the port, I'll bring my colleague Alistair Welsh as well, who can talk of transport until you've all got bored, I think. Lovely. But, but thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Uh, now we'd like to move on to the carbon roadmap uh, part of the meeting. Uh, I think what I'd like to do, first of all, is just remind everybody of the recommendations the policy committee is asked to comment upon the carbon neutrality roadmap and in particular that in the recognition of the need to be greener faster in order to meet carbon neutrality targets by 2030 as a matter of urgency to a prioritize and seek funding for the highest impact actions within our scope b identify ways to use developer community infrastructure levy and other funding to drive or unlock change c put carbon at the heart of relationship key partners and to accelerate delivery. D, scale up actions and increase pace of delivery. The policy committee supports the adoption of the carbon neutrality roadmap as evidence base from which to develop the future council strategy. Um, so I'd like to start off with a public participation uh, and try and keep it to these recommendations. Uh, uh, Chris, you'd like to come up? you have three minutes. Thank you very much and good evening everybody. I'm really pleased to be here to be able to contribute on behalf of Winchester Action on the Climate Crisis to your discussions. I wanted to start by congratulating you both for your leadership in setting 2030 as a target and also for commissioning this report because it's really important to get a good overview of all the different things that could be done. And I also wanted to say that we uh, wholeheartedly support the recommendations, particularly the importance of prioritising the highest impact actions and finding the money for them, and looking at how to use different sources, putting carbon at the heart of your relationship with the partners and scaling up your actions. So I'm going to concentrate on the bits of the report, of your report and the bits of the WSP report that we think are particularly important and not go into all the small print. 
Um, because we think that the WSP report has got a lot of really good things in it, although we're a bit worried that it doesn't seem to entirely add up to reaching 2030 or even getting well on the way to 2030. It feels like it's got all the bits, but hasn't quite made a jigsaw puzzle of them yet. Um, we definitely welcome the top priority given to using um, solar power and generating more renewable energy, <coughs> although we do think that 50 megawatt per peak is far too low. The, the ideas that are already on the table and the proposals that are coming up at the moment will add you up to that. We think it should be 500, I mean, just as a rule of thumb rather than 50. It really is much too low. And they've got a big emphasis on rooftops. Of course, everybody likes solar panels on rooftops. It's obvious, but rooftops aren't going to give you enough solar power. You need to have solar farms and probably some other things as well, like wind turbines. Secondly, we also wholeheartedly support the idea of reducing demand on energy for, for uh, transport. Absolutely. Uh, but we do think that focusing entirely on electric vehicle charging is not entirely the only and right way to concentrate. There are an awful lot of other things that should be done. And even in local transport plan four, they've got the ambition to reduce car journeys by 10%. So we would urge you when you're drawing up your plans to at the very least put 10% as your target, whereas the ideas in the WSP report come up to somewhere between a half and three and a half percent of transport cuts, and that's definitely not enough. Thirdly, yes, absolutely, renewable heating measures in homes is really important. And we only wanted to say, while you're doing that, don't forget the really good ideas in your own local plan about having the Letty standards for new homes. We think those two things obviously go together and need to be linked up. What we definitely were anxious about when we read the WSP report, and um, I was pleased that it doesn't have an emphasis in the report to this committee, was their reliance on carbon offsetting. We can't possibly support uh, a proposal in which they're suggesting that you plan for a scenario that reduces annual emissions by only 40% by 2030. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm at my end. Yeah. Okay, fine. Thank you if you like so to. We wanted to say, please be more ambitious than WSP and stick to the ideas in here and work together with people. Thank you. Have you got any questions? For... No. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Wallace, please. You have five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I'll be up and down today. There's lots of interesting items, but I'll, I'll talk. Um, I'm not going to go over the same points we've just heard. I, I, I was going to speak on those as well, but I'll, I'll skip that bit. I'll just say, um, a few weeks ago, I watched a film called The Letter. Um, some of you may have seen it brings together the four of the different voices uh, that Pope Francis highlighted in, in his uh, address, Laudato Se, and was a really powerful way of presenting some of the issues around climate change. Um, if you, it, it is available on YouTube, if some of you might have seen it, if you haven't, I urge you to watch it. Um, one of the voices in the film is a gentleman, gentleman called Aruna Kande, from Senegal, who represents the poor. He comes from a village that is being swallowed up by the sea because of climate change. And it's destroying the livelihoods of the people who live there. And during the film, Aruna, uh, he travels to Rome with the others. But uh, in a key, mo in a key moment for, stood out from me from the film, Aruna hears that his village has been flooded and the children in the orphanage have nowhere to sleep. They can't go to sleep that night. They have to stand up. In another moment, he receives a call telling him that a friend has left the village because there was no work, because you know, he was flooded, and he's made his way to Europe and is feared drowned on the crossing. The 
The reason I raise these issues is to show the real impact that climate change is, is already happening around the world, that people are already dying from the impacts. But what we're talking about here is really important and we must, we must move it forward as fast as we can. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? No. If you'd like to go, um, that's all right. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I very much welcome the opportunity to present the Carbon Neutrality Roadmap report to the committee. Um, this report does set out the scale of the challenge facing the district and the need to go greener faster, to get anywhere close to the district playing its proper part in preventing the catastrophic global warming currently predicted by the science. And indeed, as was referred to in Councillor Wallace, we can already see its impacts happening in many parts of the world, including in this country, um, where I still have flowers in my garden uh, going strong at a time of year when we'd normally expect them to be long dead. Um, the report lays out the actions which can be taken to make the biggest difference, um, recommends priorities and shows who needs to be involved. This is, of course, something which is not just the City Council's responsibility. Residents, businesses, County Council, national government all need to contribute and in many areas take the lead. Um, this is an overview report um, and the intention is to use it as an evidence base to update the Carbon Neutrality Action Plan as well as other related documents, prioritise our partnership work and accelerate our progress as a district towards net zero. Um, so with that overview, then I'll hand over to Anna Wise, our Sustainability Officer, to give you a presentation in much more detail. Thank you, Councillor Lerney. Um, good evening, Chairman and members of the committee. Um, I'm going to update you on the carbon neutrality roadmap, uh, the contents, the output, key findings and next steps. So the context is the Council published our carbon neutrality action plan in January 2020. Um, following declaration of a climate emergency. Um, and the action plan acknowledged to meet the ambition of being a carbon neutral by district by 2030. All sectors and responsible parties have to make a significant reduction in emissions. And a number of uh, themes were identified, transport, commercial energy and domestic energy. But they were high level when it came to the actions for the district and were not quantified in terms of carbon impact, cost, timing, and so on. So that didn't provide the details required to enable us to prioritize those actions or to provide sufficient detail on what needed to be done by whom across the district to achieve carbon neutrality. So this is the process um, that we used in writing the Carbon Neutrality Action Plan. Similar to the Plan Do Check Act methodology that British Sanders use, it's a circular process that seeks to capture the steps the Council will go through as we implement our journey to carbon neutrality. So phase one was the baseline data, quick wins and priorities, and those were captured in the Carbon Neutrality Action Plan. Um, and at this point, it was recognised um, that a district roadmap would be required to identify those key measures, guide investment priorities, funding bids, and so on. So that's where the roadmap sits in that phase two of the process. And during um, the consultation process by WSP, over 29 stakeholders participated in the workshops and that included representatives of 12 parishes, um, uh, a good length session with 
WINAC and also with other key stakeholders, including Hampshire County Council, who are also key in this process. So the objectives um, for the Carbon Neutrality Roadmap were to identify the best measures to become carbon neutral by 2030 and to quantify those impacts and also to, to create a roadmap modelling tool that can be updated to give us timely information on progress on delivery. The project outputs are listed in the report and they are the carbon neutrality roadmap, which is included in your council papers tonight, an executive summary and also a carbon neutrality modelling tool that um, we can adjust as we go along our, our journey on that. Turning to the key findings, um, the consultants modelled the interventions in our carbon neutrality um, action plan and they found that they wouldn't um, be sufficient to reach um, carbon neutrality or net zero uh, by 2030. So they have proposed uh, 16 further interventions which will reduce emissions um, by 1,116 kilotons of carbon dioxide um, which are summarised in the report and this table um, summarises those key interventions. Of these, um, WSP have advised that three have the greatest potential to reduce emissions um, of the interventions they've identified. They identify these as generating utility scale solar, um, transport, um, transitioning to electric vehicles um, to decarbonise private car use and by implementing um, renewable heating and hot water measures um, in domestic settings as the um, three most effective of those interventions they have identified. I thought it might be useful at this point to recap some of our progress to date because we have achieved some, some good things. We've, um, for example, not only installed 849 square metres of solar panels at the Sport and Leisure Park, we've also got 740 panels on our um, housing properties and over 600 on our commercial assets. We have in installed, um, it says here, 40 new electric vehicle charging points. I think that's now over 50. Um, planted over 1,000 trees, adopted the biodiversity plan and so on. Um, looking at the interventions and how they're set out in the report in a, a little more detail, the consultants have med med modelled these at four levels, um, low, medium, high and very high scenarios. So uh, I've just pulled out an example of domestic here um, and these are reflected in our modelling tools where we can adjust those to see what impact they would, would have. They've also um, listed um, the co-benefits, carbon savings, an estimated cost and lead partners for them. So in chapter six of the report, you'll find the interventions listed um, with some of the pathways of, of how we could achieve that um, outlined. This um, graph shows uh, the current existing actions um, being modelled and the upper section um, of the graph is the business as usual model and that um, reflects some current government policies, for example, electricity grid decarbonisation, transport electrification and um, a raise in the standards of the domestic minimum energy efficiency standard to reach um, EPCC levels in um, private sector rental. So that's the, the top tranche. But you can see that that uh, um, is not going to get us to carbon neutral by 2030, which is indicated by the red line on the graph. Um, and this second graph represents 
um, the modelled um, interventions at a medium effort level. Um, I might add that the medium level effort is still quite a step change um, in investment and, and effort from where we are at the moment. Um, that would leave residual annual carbon emissions of 377 kilotons of carbon dioxide equivalent. Um, the very high, the high scenario will get us to zero, but uh, again, um, I think WSP took a view on balancing what they thought would be achievable um, in, in getting to um, modelling these pathways. So coming back to the carbon neutrality action plan process, um, we're now on phase three, which is how um, we will get there. Um, so that is adapting delivery plans, um, which may include biodiversity action plan, the uh, green economic development strategy, um, movement strategy and so on as well as the Carbon Neutrality Action Plan, which will need to be revised to incorporate um, some of the recommendations. And then, of course, we um, continue to report to this committee annually on um, how we, whether we're on track and, and how we're doing. Um, just to pull out that third quartile in a bit more detail, um, the roadmap um, which we've commissioned uh, provides us with expert advice. So uh, we're now in a process of re reviewing the recommendations to understand the cost, responsibility for um, implementation, carbon impact and so on. We will need to consult extensively with internal and with external colleagues and stakeholders to identify and quantify strategic priorities and the funding and staff resources available for delivery. So that will lead to a revision of the carbon neutrality action plan and potentially other relevant policies um, over the coming year. So our next steps are to devise a programme um, to review these policies as, um, and uh, our implementation plans to facilitate delivery. Um, aligning our interventions with the, the CNAP, but also the council plan and presenting a revised action plan uh, for 23 and 24 initially and potentially up to 2030. We'll also need to develop a funding strategy to deliver the interventions. And um, obviously it's not just the responsibility of Winchester Council, but of a range of partners, whether that's Hampshire County Council, central government, um, business, um, residents, etc. Um, it will also involve briefing and engagement with partners and stakeholders. And we have um, a members briefing, which is scheduled for the 2nd of February. Um, and we are planning to brief stakeholders through a carbon neutrality open forum, which has um, potentially been set uh, to be confirmed of the 9th of February. Um, and also there's um, a member's decision day, um, actually in January, apologies, to adopt the carbon neutrality roadmap as the evidence base from which to develop our future strategy. Strategic policies we'd be looking at, as mentioned, the climate uh, neutrality action plan will be absolutely key. Um, biodiversity action plan and the green economic development strategy and movement strategy. Thank you. That concludes my presentation. Thank you. Councillor David Cooper. Thank you for that really excellent report and, and, and for this generally, which I suspect we've all got hundreds of questions on it. Um, just starting with one. Uh, and looking at the single biggest um, cumulative, cumulative reduction, put my teeth in, uh, in terms of the additional emissions we need to remove, and that's the electric vehicle charging to de decarbonise private cars. Is there some easy wins that we can get in the short term on that? To, um, because that looks like 
quite an you know quite an important uh, piece of work. And actually, is it just the infrastructure that's needed, or presumably it's people shifting to using EV cars? That uh, and so that reduction is actually not just chargers; it's actually um, more more detailed than that. Sorry, it's a very long question, Council. Uh, I can't say <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a, that's not a problem. Um, I think the issue with EV is that it's important that we don't kind of get too far ahead of the curve, um, because obviously we can put in loads of electric car chargers, but if people don't get the electric cars, it will have no impact. The other thing is we're already seeing a shift from where we expected things to be a few years ago. We were talking very much about lots of on street chargers, you know, plugging into lampposts and things. And now we're much more moving towards the idea of effectively electric petrol stations, if you like, where you rock up, plug into a high speed charger, have a cup of coffee and come out and whiz away again. And it's not quite clear where those trends are taking us. So, so our aim at the moment is to increase the amount of car charging available in the district. We're in particular having a look at areas where we know there are electric cars, but not many public car charging points. So, for example, we've identified Allsford as an area where there aren't many charging points, but actually a, a good number of people who have electric cars. So it's focusing our efforts in those kind of areas. Um, so I wouldn't quite describe it as a quick win, but I think that's definitely one where we're on the right trajectory. Thank you. Would you like to sorry, Councillor Bathard? Thank you, Chair. Sorry. Um, yeah, thank you for the uh, the report. Um, I was just uh, interested um, in that uh, the um, uh, recommendations uh, seem to be very heavily uh, weighted in terms of the private individual in terms of the areas that we're actually looking at. Um, I note from the report that there's also um, um, the support, the mandate of the installation of energy efficiency and heating, which is actually of uh, industry, um, point number seven. Um, in terms of actually sharing the load, uh, would it not be sort of uh, worthwhile having sort of uh, an extension into uh, uh, the public, into the, the sort of uh, commercial world, as well as the, uh, the private uh, individual? Thank you. Uh, yep, we're already doing work with a number of businesses around um, improving not any issues like their insulation, but potentially solar panels and so on. So I don't know if, if uh, Sue Robbins would like to say a few words about that. Uh, thank you. Yes, we, we do recognise the contribution that businesses and industry can play within our uh, district to this whole agenda. Um, we have several strands of work on that. We are looking at a sustainable tourism strategy and how we can move that sector. Um, we are also uh, running support services at the moment for businesses to reduce their carbon and put in um, uh, green measures and we have um, additional resource now to help deliver our green economic development strategy and we're particularly looking at uh, the projects that have come out of that piece of work and how we can support the whole um, commercial sector in, in moving along with the residents as well. Well first to, and I, I rather enjoyed reading this report uh, it was a refreshing change. I could actually understand most of it, um, which is helpful. So it's not just, of course, it's councillors, it's for officers and members of the public as well. Um, but what worried me that the modelling was based on figures of 2019 uh, is, the first part question, WSB going to write an addendum that takes into account what's happened since then, including the cost of energy and the impact that that's going to have on general way of life and indeed house building. Uh, we've learnt that a bit from the Michel Endeavour development where we've had to pump in extra funding, much more I think than we thought we might have to do. That's not a criticism of what has happened, it's just a reality, a practical statement on that. The other thing that worries me a little bit, you concentrate a lot on council housing, naturally, because that's something that we have direct control of. Um, 5,900 on pocket change numbers of council houses mentioned two or three times in the report. Nothing is mentioned about housing association 
affordable housing. Are housing associations involved in this? Um, did they come along to the stakeholders' meetings? So that's a question there. My next question is your reports, um, page 14, refers on uh, paragraph 2.6 to review of land management strategy, agriculture and land management strategy, um, carbon sequestration through soils and green infrastructure such as verge management. I don't know what the total area of verges is in the Winchester district, but it really is. I know it's important for conservation point of view, but it's hardly worth mentioning for carbon saving. But what, what I'm saying is, major landowners, farmers, insurance companies, were they part of your deliberation? Because if you're going to be talking about land management, they're the guys who do the land management. And if you're just going to ignore them, no matter what you say, it's not going to make a penneth of difference. Their job is to make money, not necessarily to following the carbon, or many of them are. Um, a couple that I know certainly are doing a lot to change their methods. I don't refer to that. The other thing it mentions in here about, I noticed one of the experts in WSP is a um, forestry guy. There's a lot about tree management and so on. And the comment in here is, we're not planting enough trees. Um, he said, yes, you started. I think it's what it's a hundred plus year um, on council on land. I think uh, Council Lernier said that a couple of times. Never said how much land we actually do earn, as to get an impression of whether whether we could have put more on that land uh, or not. Uh, th th there are little things like that that worry me <coughs> not a little bit. Generally, the general trend. I'm very much in favour of this report, and I would praise it. But for those points, which I think, I suspect Chris was going to get on to talking about, she didn't have the time, um, are going to be crucial if you want to the district to get to carbon neutral by 2030. That's only seven years down the road. Um, and you're only talking about a small fraction of the district. Over to you, whoever. I'll leave it to the trial. Thank you. Um, a number of these issues have actually been covered in uh, documents like the Green Economic Development Strategy. Um, the council itself doesn't own very much land, um, particularly um, most of the land that we do own has a tendency to be sports fields, which obviously, while we could plant trees all over it, that wouldn't necessarily be the best thing for the health of, health of the district. Um, so, but I think one of the important things there to remember is that the council doesn't have to do everything. So, for example, Hampshire County Council has a very strong tree planting program um, and they will be planting um, far more trees in the district than is suggested um, in this report. So some of these actions we can say City Council doesn't need to put in extra resource here. We do actually already have partners who are playing their part. And the important thing is that we work with them to assess the impact that that makes, um, which we can then feed into um, the action plan going forward. And we will be adjusting this as we go on. This is a, an overview at this point in time. Um, unfortunately, with the data, there is always a significant lag. I don't know if Anna wants to say something about the data we have. So um, WSP used the data that was available at that time, which is the 2019 um, Bayes data. There is always a lag in Bayes publishing their data. They have now, since that, that report was put together, published the 2020 data. But through the modelling tool, we are able to incorporate that into their trajectories. So each year, as the Bayes and other data from the district emerges, the intention is that we would use the tool to keep it uh, a more of a real-time one. And um, just before I pass to my colleague, I would, to answer your question, we didn't have a large social um, um, housing landlord at the stakeholder group, but we'll take on board your point because we are working with them much more closely through the cost of living um, 
work that we're doing um, and we'll be intending to work with a very wide range of, of stakeholders. A little bit, Anna, the question I must ask in Council, I think last, last time around, maybe the, the time before, as to where your priorities lie. We only produce, what, 66% or thereabouts of our own food. Uh, which means the rest is imported. Uh, that's not cheap in terms of carbon. The, and especially as some of the food that we're eating, of course, is on land which is being cleared, forestry land. Farm oil comes to mind straight away. Um, the, the, the other issue is there's one or two important facts that I thought would be there. You mentioned quite rightly the uh, leisure centre solar panels, but our own building. We've got a city office back there with solar panels on the roof. Didn't you know they were there? It's, it begs the question. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, it's, but it, it, I would have thought if you're praising yourself about the leisure park, just viably so, why not say, well, we've already started this work by putting these on our own building. But again, how many solar panels do you put on council housing? Uh, I think... I mean, one thing is that actually we've done so much in this area of work that if we could list them all, that would take far longer than um, I'm sure Councillor Laming would let us have in the meeting. So, of course, there are a huge number of these projects that we've been, been involved with, for example, down at Marwell, where we've put solar panels on some of their buildings. So it's not just our buildings that we've covered. Um, in terms of the housing associations, um, some of our housing partners um, have similar um, are also looking at that 2030 target for becoming net zero. Um, so clearly they've got their own plans. And again, we would encourage them to carry on working on their own housing. The biggest issues in terms of um, energy efficiency are in the private rented sector, which is one of the hardest areas for us to reach um, in terms of trying to advertise you know, grants that are available and, and so on, particularly for low income families. So that's clearly something where we need to keep working to reach those private landlords and encourage them to do the work. That's an area where government is helping by increasing the energy EPC requirements um, on rented housing. And again, we need this, you know, carrot and stick approach to a lot of this. We can't make it all happen on our own, but what we can do is A, try and take control of what we can do, B, encourage others to do what they can do um, and see lobby government, you know, to move faster themselves and try and Give move from that 2050 target to something that more closely matches the science. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Warwick. Yes, thank you, Chairman, and thank you for this report. It's really neat. It was nice, nice to read and Kelsey and I have met <laughs> to discuss the challenges that we both face. And, and, and you know, what I would say, you could throw a huge amount of money and wouldn't fix this. So it has to be partnership working, whether you're government, county, or district, or private enterprise. The, the Hampshire's just partnered with um, the Forest Partnership to do something called Mayawaki Mini Forests, which can be built on something the size of a tennis court. So I don't know how many of those tennis courts we could build, we could plant on, but, but, but we've pledged to plant a million trees by 2050 and 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 it, and it is small it, it, it'll be small it'll be parishes or, or schools or farms that can find small areas of land that can plant these densely packed forests which grow better if they're if they're planted more densely apparently I, I had a question and it, it's it's one I don't have an answer to so forgive me for asking you this and I probably shouldn't be but domestic heating I know Chris will know we've had some quick wins from decarbonisation of the electricity grid. So, so we, we look like we're doing well as that grid decarbonised, but, but most of our domestic heating is, is gas. And, and your, um, your report talks about clean hydrogen being used in our heating system. I just wondered if you had a timeline for when that is likely to take place, because it would be great if that was a solution so we could retrofit of boilers and heating systems using hydrogen being everybody off gas would seem to be a good solution but I just wondered if you had a timeline for that. 
yeah, if only is, is I think, where we are on that one. Um, I think the general conclusion that's been come to is that while um, green hydrogen might play a part in some of this, because it's much um, less energy efficient to produce green hydrogen than it is to simply produce electricity, uh, then in, for an awful lot of uses, then moving down the all electric route is a better way to go. The issue with that is clearly around needing to go fabric first in buildings, making sure they're properly insulated uh, before you try and use electric heating, which you know is is not as quick as gas to to heat a room. So there are quite a few issues. Uh, what we may see is some hydrogen being simply inserted into the gas grid as a small replacement, um, although even that has complications. Uh, yes, we could replace all the boilers in the country, but I'm not sure at how carbon efficient that would be actually, in, rather than going towards electric heating. Um, I do have quite good contacts into the hydrogen industry. Uh, my um, uncle actually runs a, a firm which develops um, hydrogen refueling equipment and they're based up in Scotland where there is the prospect of huge amounts of clean energy to produce hydrogen but I think principally certainly their thought is that you're looking at large vehicles such as trucks um, and even planes is the direction a lot of that hydrogen uh, may well be going in the future. So hydrogen is definitely a possibility, uh, but I think if we're looking at that 2030 target seriously, then we need to be pushing on the electrical um, solution. But even that is harder than it seems because while if, if everybody went out tomorrow, then our electrical connections would fail. We already heard earlier on about how decarbonizing the ship industry is a problem simply because we don't have the electrical infrastructure. And that's another area where we need government to be really pushing and encouraging the spending on the infrastructure we are going to need. Thank you. Uh, Can I just come tip? back really quickly because actually what you say is really relevant. So when I visited the port, you know the massive cruise ships that come in, they can, they can power those when they're in port, electricity, much electricity to those two so it's if you've got five cruise ships you could it's <laughs> not there two it's very interesting yeah well we have yeah well, the problem is that you can only put in a certain percentage of hydrogen, otherwise you get a problem with the gas mains. Uh, Councillor Cooper. Th thank you very much, uh, Chair. And, and just to say quickly to the, everyone, I'm, I, I do apologise. My three layers of childcare fell through this evening, um, hence why I'm popping up and in and out. And I really am grateful for everyone's patience. Um, I think the patience of the small people outside is falling away, so I will have to disappear soon. So I, will, I always learn from Councillor Pearson uh, in these meetings. I'm going to um, do, do a Pearson and ask potentially two or three quick questions in one go. Um, uh, and, and also just say that, because I won't have time for debate, I suspect that this, this I think is the, if, it's certainly one if not the most important piece of work the Council is doing. Um, uh, uh, precisely the sort of sentiment that um, uh, Councillor Wallace said that this is so, so important. And I think hard decisions will probably be, have to be made. And I think that as a council, we should set an example by making them in these areas. Um, just digging into a bit of the detail on the um, WSP report on the recommendations they make. First question around um, offsetting. Um, now, offsetting, I always worry about offsetting as a principle. Um, I appreciate that it's something which is better than nothing. Um, but I think actually there was a, a, a paper here quite recently where it was sort of very clear that it's a, it's, a, it's a kind of secondary option. It's not the kind of primary option. And I would just ask whether they're, if they, we were to do offsetting, which is, a, which, which like I say, it's better than nothing, that we have a plan, very clear plan to come off it uh, and, and, and offset and, and, and reduce our carbon emissions so we don't have to offset so much. There's a question as well whether that can happen. On the waste collection, our recommendation. Presumably that is all 
completely contingent on the joint municipal waste management strategy, which I don't think is really picked up too much in this report as to the implications of that and what needs to happen. Because as I understand it, it's all well and good saying we should increase recycling and Winter City Council has done really good work in the last few years in that area. But as I understand it, to go further, that wider strategy needs to needs to happen in terms of the infrastructure in the county. So it's just a point really on that. And then finally, on low low traffic neighbourhoods, page 118, uh, page 92 of the report, page 118 of our papers. Um, just the question is that, you know, again, that's a, that's dependent on the Winchester movement strategy, I think, uh, as to whether that's going to be something that can happen. But is there any way we can do something like that quicker in Winchester, similar to what Bristol have done? Um, because although that will be probably pretty unpopular, it's the sort of thing that I think say we're going to make these hard decisions we as council should try and do so it's a query as to the possibility of that really and how, how, how possible it is thank you very much for indulging me chair thank you for coming thank you starting with offsetting um i absolutely agree with you councillor tippett cooper there is only so much offsetting the world can do you know all these people flying in planes there isn't enough space to plant all the trees in the world that it would take if people carry on on the current course. Uh, we do have a paper coming in the new year around the council's own offsetting policy and strategy, so we'll be covering that off there. But um, for me, certainly offsetting should only be a temporary solution before we go um, properly um, zero carbon, um, which hopefully um, is possible over time. So certainly while we might need to do some offsetting, um, certainly look to taper that off as rapidly as possible. Um, with waste collection, you're right that to a degree we are reliant on um, other people's work and choices. But I would say there that actually uh, while we talk about recycling, a lot of this is around that reduce, reuse um, part of things, you know, if we produce less waste, if we consume less, then there will be less rubbish going through the system and that equally can have a very large impact. Um, so again, we'll be working with the County Council and the other authorities in Project Integra on those kind of systems. Um, and obviously we're also looking at our, con our waste contract and um, how we run our waste vehicles and so on. Again, the Biffa building is another one where we've put solar panels on it. So, you know, we are working on there. Uh, with regards to the Winchester movement strategy, um, to a degree, um, while we might say we're reliant on it, the movement strategy actually sets the direction of travel. Um, it doesn't necessarily say all the ways we might get there. So, for example, we have the Mini Holland uh, feasibility that we've been doing and hopefully there will be a big tranche of um, government money attached to that. Um, there are likely to be some controversial decisions as you refer to uh, which may not be universally popular um, attached to that and that is something which if we're really serious about pushing on this agenda we will have to be willing to take what are potentially unpopular decisions. Thank you. Councillor Cook, thanks very much for coming. Thank you, Councilor Chair. Taylor. I think we've all agreed that the clock is very much ticking and uh, the, the year 2030 will soon be upon us, so uh, seven years to go as of such. So I was a bit surprised, Anna, when you did say that you would be reporting annually to us. Have I, have I read that wrong or heard that wrong? Because I think reporting back to us annually, I would like it to be ideally quarterly but uh, maybe six months, because you can really understand, you know, if we're doing something, is it what we're doing, is it correct? Could we do something differently? And you need people's input. That's what we're here for. So I'm, I'm surprised at annually, if I heard correctly. Thank you. Um, I'll take that. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, we have uh, reporting quarterly through the Council's performance reporting. So there are some key indicators that we will make sure that are updated and demonstrate progress over a year period. 
what I think we were trying to demonstrate here is there are some key milestones that we need to come back to this policy committee with. And that would be a, say, a refresh of the programme for the, that year ahead. Um, and so there will be um, annual reporting with regard to that. But then as issues or policies within that year need to be developed, we will come back as and when that is required. So there's, a, there's, there's many routes to the reporting. Um, it, we wouldn't be here just once. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, right, I, I like uh, Councillor Tippett Cooper. I have multiple questions here, so let's just keep them brief. I um, want to pick up on some of the big stones in here because they're the ones we need to attack if we're going to get to this very large number of reductions. So, firstly, you've excluded um, motorways from the, uh, the transport number. The transport is 48% of the carbon footprint district. Motorway is about a third of that. Um, now, I'm well aware that as Winchester City Council, we're not responsible for 99% of the carbon footprint. And uh, you're telling me that we're going to be responsible for driving down the carbon footprint on A roads, B roads, whatever. We excluded motorway. I just think we should include motorway in our roadmap. It's a big piece of it. Um, we talked about offset, um, Council Learning. Um, Looking at the graphs, offset is a huge number. 2030 is still there in 2050. I do think you need to have an answer to that offset. And I can't believe that we'd ever be paying £7.5 million pounds a year of taxpayers' money to offset from 2030 onwards. Um, you, number three on your, your most uh, um, high um, priority um, items is renewable, uh, is renewable heating. But that has to go hand in hand with um, insulation and the fabric first approach. I, I, I think the fabric first approach will deliver benefits today and could possibly be uh, prioritised a little bit higher because that needs to be in place for the renewable heating. Uh, without that, things won't work very well. Um, and my final point, Energy generation is, is clearly really important. There's a lot of focus on solar, although as we've heard from Chris Holloway, not enough focus on solar. It could be, should be much bigger. But we don't get much solar this time of year. So I, I think you possibly need to look more diversely at energy generation um, inside the district or outside the district in terms of uh, filling those gaps. Um, so WSP follows um, a methodology that's put forward by Bayes and um, is consistently applied, I think, in, you know, reports of this kind. So that's why it wasn't included was because that methodology didn't include motorways. We don't actually include motorway transport emissions in our own um, district's carbon footprint at the moment. Um, but obviously we recognise that I think 30% of journeys in the, in the area are made on motorways for local traffic. So um, the roadmap is just recommendations and we will be sort of studying them as we go forward. Um, just on offsetting, um, I don't think it's proposed that we would pay that sum for offsetting. Um, that there's responsibility, you know, across the whole district. Um, and it's... Um, Something certainly that, that we will be liaising with partners um, and working towards how that would be be done. But our offsetting, I think initially we're going to look at council carbon footprint first and then work up to the district. Um, and your last point was on insulation and, and renewable heating. And I know insulation is a really big focus of our own council house retrofit programme at the moment. So we'll, we'll certainly be sort of looking at all those angles as we um, integrate it into our council policy. Yeah, um, if I can add on the offsetting, um, actually, I think that's a really useful number because I think it emphasises to people, if you were to take that offsetting route rather than actually taking action to reduce your carbon footprint, you are talking about absolutely massive amounts of money, which clearly are it's if essentially wasted money. Why would we offset elsewhere as opposed to actually reducing our carbon footprint and investing within the district? So um, absolutely agree about that very large number and 
we need to work on reducing it, but I think it's a good number to have out there. Um, so I welcome that. Um, I think um, Anna covered most of the rest of it. Um, in terms of energy generation, um, I absolutely agree with you around solar. Um, but on the, I mean, there are, um, again, we come back to the infrastructure, you know, improved electrical interconnection will be a massive help in this area. You know, certainly I'm aware of one project which aims to build, to bring um, solar energy from the Sahara um, to southern England uh, through Devon, actually. Um, so these things are already, already going on and the investors are out there you know, working on these kind of things. So that will come, but again, that improved infrastructure is really important to that. Um, we're also, um, I'm also hoping, uh, personally, again, this might be quite controversial in areas that um, government will relax its effective moratorium on onshore wind. Um, the point was made earlier on about, you know, solar t taking up land, which could be used for, food, um, wind has a much lower footprint um, and personally I quite like them on the landscape but as I say that is a slightly controversial view. Yeah, uh, thanks Councillor Ernie. Um, just on the energy generation, we, we had um, a nice uh, presentation to talk about the free ports there and uh, the UK is the windiest place in Europe but it also has the highest tidal ranges of anywhere in Europe as well, or probably north coast of France. Um, but we live right on the edge of this, uh, so some cooperation with adjacent authorities in that area might be advantageous for us to look at as a, a part of our roadmap. Thank you. Um, we spent rather a long time on this particular subject. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Um, just a really quick question. Do we still feel we're going to be on target to reach 2030? Uh, the report's quite clear that right now we're not on target and that we need to do a lot more if we're going to actually shift that trajectory to get to a point where we can feel comfortable. Um, I can't say we've ever actually been on target, but I think we're now in a better place to understand what we need to do and the efforts it's going to take to get us there. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I'm inclined to, when I read this report, agree with what you just said, sadly. Um, when I'm looking at the retrofitting costs, putting um, 15 million over 10 years, which I think is one of the recent papers, um, when the Tories were dealing, it was 2 million a year for retrofitting. When you came in, reduced to 1.5, which is the same rate. Now we've got massive inflation. Do you think that 15 million is going to be enough to cover what we need to cover with retrofitting? Um, I don't recognise those figures that you've just given. I'd have to go back and have a look at that. Um, no, it's always been recognised that that wasn't sufficient, but in terms of what we wanted to do with our own stock. Uh, but obviously we still want to leverage in government money where that becomes available, um, look at different ways of doing things, more efficient ways. But it's also important to recognise that actually our council housing stock, if you look at all the different kinds of stock within the district, is actually um, in pretty good condition um, in terms of the average EPCs. If we were going to concentrate investment anywhere, like I say, we'd really want to go for that private rented sector housing, which is generally um, the worst insulated. Uh, thank you. Um, we spent rather a long time on this uh, particular subject, which is very important to us. Um, would anybody like to have any others to say before we go to the recommendations? No. Are we content with the recommendations as laid out in the report? Thank you. We move on to the next report, please. Thank you for a very good presentation.
Oh, thank you. Uh, for this report, we have the recommendation that committee notes and comments on the achievements and outcomes of the three-year contract with crowdfunder, results of the consultations with organisations regarding crowdfunding and access to the council match funding, and the proposed option to cease crowdfunding for the Winchester scheme and transfer the budget to a community grant project scheme. Thank you. Councillor Wallace. No? Okay. Oh, thank you. <laughs> We're a bit peace and quiet now. <laughs> right. So, should we start, Councillor Ferguson? Um, yes, thank you, Chair. And it's um, all changed at the top table. Um, so, first of all, I'd like to thank the committee for giving us the opportunity to bring the report to you this evening. It examines the impact of the Council's crowdfunding platform what it's actually done over the last three years. The Crowdfund Winchester Grant Scheme was set up in 2019 and it brought together a number of different grant schemes into a single fund. And it was hoped that this new innovative approach to raising, raising funds would encourage and incentivize more fundraising. And what we all recognize is a very vibrant voluntary sector within the Winchester district. Many of those organisations work very closely alongside the City Council to provide a wide range of services and activities across the district. And to do that, they need to fundraise. Two of the funds within the Crowdfund Winchester Grant Scheme were also um, available for applications from businesses, which was a new innovation to that scheme. The report outlines the impact of the scheme and shows that in many ways, the scheme has achieved what we had hoped it would in that it has raised additional funds to those that would have been available through a direct grant scheme. And it has improved innovation, particularly digital innovation for those organisations which took part in the scheme. However, the report also outlines some of the challenges of the scheme and what, what it has meant both in terms of the resource requirements to support the scheme and also the additional demands it has made of applicants. We very much welcome the committee's comments on the report, its achievement, and in particular the recommendation for how the remainder of the grant fund is used this year and the next financial year, recognising that a full grant funding review will be completed next year. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I'm sorry, and I, I've got, delighted I've got um, Melissa Fletcher and Jane Chu with me as well, and I believe Melissa wanted to add something. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. Um, Councillor Ferguson. Yeah, I just wanted to add a couple of little points here. Um, Councillor Ferguson has outlined most of them um, in her introduction, but um, as, um, as this contract is coming to an end at the end of December, um, I just wanted to recognise that some of the principles of funding, including the innovation and leveraging the additional income generation were met. Um, the platform um, managed to raise an additional 58,000 in income, which in equates to about £17,000 per year, um, which was over and above what, what, um, what we expected. Um, however, um, because of the downturn in terms of COVID and the lack of activity and the lower um, take up, um, it, 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 the, um, the, the, the amount didn't come to the, what we had originally anticipated. However, in terms of financial support, um, Winchester's average donation, as you may expect, it was approximately £58, which is three times higher. But because the um, volume on the platform was lower, unfortunately, it didn't, um, didn't equate to how we, how we thought it would. Um, every £1 pledged by Winchester City Council leveraged £3 worth of funding, which are all positives. However, as the new higher pricing structure, coupled with the very low demand in Winchester for crowdfunding, it leads us to the conclusion that once the three-year contract ceases at the end of this month, uh, we will no longer continue to provide the crowdfunding platform as a fundraising option as part of our grant funding program. Um, yeah, um, therefore, um, the options with regards to the remainder of the budget and the program, the grant support for 23-24 are outlined in 2.21 um, for your consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody got any questions on the report? Councillor Cook. You, you sounded really disappointed there, and, and I understand that. 
but I just wanted to know, do you think there is anything you could have done differently to make it work better? If that's okay to ask at this evening. Thank you. Um, yeah, that, that's absolutely fine. We tried um, several different ways. Um, I, I actually uh, was one in part of the um, procurement process in the first place. Um, we took on Jane in terms of our funding officer. So we've looked at it in several different ways. We've kind of come at it from completely different um, perspectives. We tried in my in my experience every single way that we can to kind of activate the um, activity in Winchester. So if you look at the crowdfunding platform as a whole, there actually isn't that many projects on there. And I think some of it is around, it's a bit of a, it's a slightly different innovative way to approach fundraising. Um, the digital skills required are a little bit maybe, um, a little bit hard, you know, a little bit higher to reach. And also what we've seen through COVID is that we've uh, volunteer, um, volunteers have dropped down. And so actually it's a massive, um, effort you know work rate for people to get the money although it is very instant uh, sometimes the grant takes quite a long time this is actually um this actually has been a little bit harder for people to to um, um access um due to various reasons i mean jane might be able to put reasons in um but we have actually yes i would say that we have we've tried every which way to make this this, this particular um platform work so you could say you've exhausted every avenue uh, pretty much. I mean, Jane, I don't know if you wanted to add anything. Yeah, I was just going to add a little bit to what Melissa said, and I think we we outlined a number of the things that we we did in in the report. So, whilst the contract has been over a three year period, we have tried to modify our, our approach as it's gone through. And um, so, we've done things like changed the amount that we could pledge in terms of match funding. We've relaxed the rules to some extent to allow people to first of all apply for a COVID recovery type. Um, activities and then more recently we relaxed it to allow some core funding to be included in people's applications and um, we've changed with crowdfunder the way training has been delivered to help people and support them through the process and um, so we have we've sort of it's evolved as the three years have gone on and we have tried quite a few different approaches um, but in in summary we just haven't seen the level of activity that we thought we might and if I may, Chair, just, just to add, when we took the crowdfunding platform on and we paid, you know, the, the annual fee that we paid for the crowdfunding support, we had anticipated that it would have less officer demand internally. So we were outsourcing some of that demand. What we found as the crowdfunding platform went on is that we actually had to, um, we had to step, sorry, there's a lot of noise behind me. We had to step back in and actually it was our grant team officers who were then doing some of that support and that direct activation, that direct promotion, which is not what we'd anticipated. The only other thing to add as well as, as well as looking at what we could do, we did do consultation with those users and ask them why they weren't applying or if they had applied, what some of the barriers were. So it wasn't just from an internal perspective, it was also speaking to those who we hoped would, would apply. So. And, and the other thing to point out in the report, it was originally three years. We then had an additional six month extension, which was free of charge to see whether there was one last push to really make this work. And that also hasn't given you know, the payback that we'd perhaps wanted. In other places, a crowdfunding scheme like this has really taken off and a lot of additional funds have been created, but it simply hasn't produced the volume of people taking part and the amount of funds that we'd hoped to have anticipated. Thank you. Councillor Vatha. Thank you very much. It's uh, a pity that uh, this uh, novel approach has not uh, obviously uh, worked in the uh, Winchester area. Um, yeah. I'd like to just um, draw the uh, sort of, um, a question about uh, the objectives. The objectives was, uh, or a couple of the objectives were to widen the base uh, that uh, those um, organisations were, you know, sort of uh, drawing their, their funding from, and to engage with a, a, a sort of wider group of uh, supporters. Are there things that uh, we can learn from the way that this has actually been implemented that uh, will continue to try to achieve those objectives, despite the fact that the crowdfunder is not then the vehicle for doing that? Thank you. 
Thanks, Councillor Bather. Yeah, that is something that we are keen to um, uh, see if we can implement through our project grant scheme, because that's actually one of the things that attracted me to the, uh, the crowdfunding platform in the first place, is because actually those who have um, generated um, funding through this platform have seen an increase in their supporters, and that's and and, um, and their projects have been um, more widely known about. So that's something that we would like to um, consider going forward. Um, and in terms of leveraging additional funding, that's something we, we, can, we can promote additional funding that's available. But unfortunately, through the crowdfunding platform, if they apply for funding, they were then notified of other funding streams that they could automatically be, you know, um, could apply for. So that is something that we can continue to kind of, um, you know, implement. Um, but it, I'm really keen on making sure that, obviously, as a community team, is to know, so that the people know what, what funding, what, what community activities are happening happening in their local areas so that is something that we want to try and um, implement however um, it's not so easy with a you know a direct grant award rather than kind of something that they've got to show that they've got 35 backers in order to get the the pledge that that's a little bit more tricky for us but that is something we definitely want to try and address in some way if we can thank you councillor pearson sorry chair sorry just if i may add first the, the other thing as well is the, there are other crowdfunding platforms and the team certainly will also be reminding people that there are those other sources. Um, so crowdfunding will exist, it just won't be the Winchester Council crowdfunding scheme. So it has actually moved quite forward as, as a different way of, of raising funds for organisations. Yes, uh, just sorry, Frank, uh, uh, just in terms of uh, that, it's obviously Part of the, the the objective was to try to take the burden off of the council as being the sole funder of these organisations, uh, and therefore, you know, anything that we can do to encourage that continuation, uh, good thing. So, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I, I'm a little like, like you. I'm a little concerned as to why there's a low take up of this fund. I mean, I mean, I've just been in at two parish council meetings along with Councillor Wallace uh, during the course of this week. And both of those parish councils were complaining they couldn't get access to CIL money. Now, is it perhaps that some of the parishes are complaining to the wrong source of funds? Have you considered that? Uh, or is the confusion between your crowdfunding and CIL as far as the parishes are concerned? Um, I'd be surprised if there was confusion about the um the range of funds that the council has available because we do quite a lot of promotion with the parish councils and I've run briefing sessions before to let people know the different sorts of funds that are available. Um, we haven't actually had any parish councils who've, who've come forward and, and decided to um, crowdfund on the platform although they have all been eligible and 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 the information has been communicated to them. I'm not quite sure why they haven't taken it up. Um, actually, no, there's, an, there's one ex Frank. I'm sorry. Do you want me to repeat all that? <laughs> <laughs> yes. I was just actually I said, I said they hadn't, but I just remembered that Oliver's Battery Parish Council recently did um, crowdfund and obtain some match funding yeah. sort of for their recreation grounds. So one parish council have taken us up. The two parish councils are Hamilton and uh, Shedfield. So there you go. You've got to open the door, tuck in there, and find out what's going on. Um, the other thing is, in terms of the crowdfunding platform, we launched it in February 2020, and then we went into COVID in March. Right. Um, so a lot of the grant activity was paused, so it's been difficult for us to reactivate it. So what normally happens is, when a crowdfunding platform is launched, they do the activation campaign, and then there's lots of a flurry of activity. That kind of didn't happen um, with this platform, so we had to reactivate it a couple of times. What you'll find also is, like I said earlier on, the volunteering, the volunteers are, are, are depleting and therefore they don't have as much time to put into fundraising in this way. Um, so there's various reasons why. We do we do put all our information in Parish Connect. And Jane does actually do brief briefings yes, with the I Parish Council. So. 
looks yeah. perfectly clear to me, but quite clearly to them. Yeah, so that so they, they do get the information, and we do do dropping sessions and and generating um, information through, um, through those kind of things. But yeah, but we will catch up with those those yeah. parish councils. I I mean I think I think the comment she makes is right. Yes, and now sometimes it is tricky. There are all these different spots of funds, and sometimes it is tricky to find your way through. Um, and so it, it may be that what we need to do is think about perhaps on occasion doing an overview of, of all the different available grant funds. And perhaps we could do a briefing or think about that yes. um, to actually look. Because we're, you know, we're obviously very keen where, the, where there is grant funding and we look at that very closely given the kind of financial pressures on the council currently where there is grant funding, we are actually keen that it does get out and get used in the community in the way that we want. So it may be something that we we can think about as a team to say, rather than promoting individual pots or individual grants across the piece, say we often have the Parish Connect, it might be something that could be a program. But, so something to consider. Thank you. Yeah, I think I would like to add that when uh, about my ward, um, we've approached grant funding. They've always been very, very helpful and pointed us in the right direction. So it does actually affect you how you approach them in the first place. Uh, any further? Sorry, Jay. Yeah, I was just going to respond on, on what Councillor Ferguson was saying. We can certainly do some more of those. That is something that we have done in the past. I think the last one we did for parish councils was earlier on this year, probably March time. Um, to be honest, they haven't been very well attended when I've held them in the past, so they've been widely publicised and the take up hasn't been great, but it's certainly something we can we can look at doing again to try and um, make it really clear about the different pots that we do have available, because I realise it can sometimes be quite confusing. Thank you. Councillor Cook, if you're quick. Uh, Microphone, Councillor Pearson. Is, is there anyone sitting coordinating all these different pots that are available? You are, because I, I've just been looking at some funding from the rural environment people. There's a whole stack of things there that don't seem to appear in anything that we're producing. Uh, and that's not unique. Sorry, when I, when I say about pots available, I'm talking about pots available from the council. So ah, I'm... right, OK. Okay. That's what I'm talking to Fair people enough. about. Yeah. And then we also advise um, organisations to speak to somebody like Community First if they're looking at a wider fundraising campaign. Thank you. Sorry, just again, just to respond to that again, Councillor Pearson, I know that we, we currently um, are looking at how people who perhaps are looking to um, introduce energy efficiency measures Homes, all the different schemes that are available where they can go, you know, owner if you're all the different schemes available to them. Absolutely grand. But it's really hard sometimes to navigate where you go, what's available to you. And I absolutely take on board at the moment the way central government seems to work is they rather than direct funding, there are many grant schemes. They are what they are eligible. So it is, it is actually a problem. But in terms of our own internal grants, Jane Chewin, she does her own with Mike. So paragraph 2.15, which talks about changes, page 173, which I think is what you just Not quite in the same words, I, I would admit that, but... Uh, yeah. Thank you, Councillor. Here's Councillor Cook. Thank you, Chair. Very quick, um, this is to Jane. You mentioned that you were speaking, I think you spoke to the parish councils back in March of this year. If you are to engage in conversation with them again, how will that be? Will that be like a little drop-in session or would it be a Teams meeting? Um, or would it be, you know, them coming in to 
council to, to, to talk through and, and reignite some of the relationships and, and make sort of enable them to understand what they can actually ask for grants. So, so how would that be? I'll have to have a think about the best way of doing it. So far, the ways we've done it before have been either as a sort of webinar on Teams that people can join and I do an overview and a presentation and then people ask questions. Alternatively, I've done it as a sort of drop-in session where people can book a time with me and we can discuss their specific fundraising requirements. Going forward, we'll have a think about what's best, um, what's the best way of reaching out to them, I think. Thank you, Chair Buckingham Mouse. Could I then suggest, if I may, that um, when you do that, could you please involve the councillors as well, those parishes, so that we can sort of prompt them, some of the clerks, etc. Is that all right? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. <laughs> Thank you. Is anybody else? No. Are we content to go straight to the recommendations? We agreed on the recommendations. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very good presentation. Um, thank, thank you, you, Chair. Thank you, Committee, for your comments. Thank you. He's there this time. Get him in a minute. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Uh, I've got Councillor Wallace wanting to speak first. As, sorry, Dave, can you mute your microphone on your laptop? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, right, air pollution is a major public health concern which has been estimated to contribute towards 40,000 excess premature deaths in the UK per year. Whilst the highest levels of air pollutants are found within our major cities and major industrial areas, it is nevertheless critical that we continue to monitor and manage air pollution locally. Today's report shows that progress has been made locally with pollution levels at all locations and now within statutory limits. So the key question is how much further we should be targeting over the next five years. Um, the report proposes I'm kind of stealing a bit of your thunder here, aren't I? I'm sorry about that. It's, it's a, um, the report proposes that locally the uh, WH interim 2 target for uh, nitrogen dioxide and the WHO interim 3 targets for PM particles should be local targets for 2027. Um, these targets represent a significant improvement over the current statutory requirements, but are still in excess of WHO recommended levels. Um, the revised targets are derived from modelling of where particulate levels are anticipated to be in 2027. So the key question for me, uh, and I'm sort of stalling all your thunder a little bit, but the key question for me is how accurate do we believe the modelling to be? Um, as a council, we should be aiming to improve air quality as quickly as possible, so the accuracy of this modelling is key to setting the right goal. Right. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, as uh, Councillor Wallace said, we're bringing you the up air quality update tonight. But it does show the good news that the air quality is improving. But, and it's important because this answers the question, we are not complacent at all. So following the dramatic improvement in the air quality in the early 2020 with the COVID lockdowns, we learned a lot, actually, because there was a continuous, continued drop in 2021 that low level compared continued to 2022 in NOx, but the PM 2.5 uh, remained at a level that was still above the World Health Organization uh, standards, so or, or some of the more stringent standards. And also, our levels have risen slightly, very slightly in 2022, and that was before events like Christmas market and people were asked to return to the offices which has made a difference to the traffic in Winchester, particularly. 
So uh, David will go through in detail how what we'd want to do, or in not, not too much detail, I hope, because we've got to go home. Uh, we'll explain to, to about retaining the AQMA, but concentrating our efforts on the Romsey Road, which, as you know, is always a crisis point for us. And working on an air quality strategy, which will enable us to reset our targets towards higher WHO targets in NOx, PM 2.5, and PM 10. So the presentation shows where we are by 2027, because it's modelled, but you'll see that actually the three form, well, David will go into that detail. I think we, I just wanted to also raise the point that we are not complacent about air quality in the rest of the district. That's important to us. It also costs a lot of money to collect that data, and we need to think very carefully about what we do with the data when we collect it, and how we communicate that with parishes and communities out there that have that data collected for them. So part of our conversation here is not necessarily tonight, but is about how we work with parishes to keep them updated about what that means, because we know lots of communities have taken responsibility for their carbon footprint in many ways. They could take responsibility for their NOx footprint too. I'll pass over to David at this point. Is there anything left for you to say? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that's the presentation done, actually. Yeah. Um, good evening, members. Good evening, Chair. Um, yeah, I've got a presentation really just to illustrate uh, what uh, Councillor Porter has just uh, eloquently summarised at the start. So, yeah, just, just to really canter through this, because I know we don't have too much time, but uh, we've had an air quality action plan since 2017. Um, and or our current uh, air quality action plan was uh, adopted in 2017. Um, we are required as local authorities within AQAP to uh, review and update that uh, plan every five years. So essentially we are, we are now at that point, so it's at a point that it is required to be reviewed. Um, it currently focuses on nitrogen dioxides, NOx. However, uh, there's been a lot of more recent research into what are called fine particulates, PM 2.5s. Uh, and the sort of health, public health impacts of those fine particulates. Um, so we are expecting new uh, new standards to be um, imposed upon local authorities by central government imminently. Um, worth mentioning that the size of the AQMA hasn't changed since it was adopted back in 2003. Um, and uh, there has been, as just been mentioned, a steady improvement in uh, air quality standards. Uh, and we would hope that would be the case, wouldn't we? But there has been uh, an improvement, uh, and uh, actually, we can we can say with some confidence that uh, that the current data is showing that most of our current air quality management area now complies with current legal levels. So those are the statutory levels set by central government. Um, we are pretty well confident we are compliant in pretty much all of our air quality management area, but with a question mark over Romsey Road as our sort of high hotspot in the May. And uh, all locations within the district are compliant. And I'm going to just talk you through some slides, which are gra graphs, obviously. Um, this graph shows the um, last six years uh, monitoring results from our two static air quality monitoring stations. These are the MCERTs, so sort of very high standard air quality monitoring stations that we have in our city. Um, it shows that uh, St George's Street in blue and Chesil Street in orange and you'll see a little red blob on the right hand side and I'll explain what that is in a second and it shows the statutory limit of 40 micrograms annual mean standard and it shows really, I, I don't want to get too hung up, but it shows that steady downward drop. Um, the last time we exceeded the statutory limit was back in 2018 and since then we've been in compliance and you'll notice that there was quite a drop between 19, uh, 2019 and 2020, which um, you won't be surprised to learn was due to COVID. Um, but there has been, although it looks quite flat, there's a slight increase since 2020. Not significant, and it certainly hasn't gone anywhere near back to pre-pandemic levels, which is good news um, and actually has surprised us. We thought there would be a much more rapid uh, increase back to pre-pandemic levels. The reason there's a gap between the orange line and the red blob is because we made the decision that um, because Chesil Street had been significantly and uh, consistently compliant with statutory levels since the last, well, 10 years, 
um, that we would no longer monitor in that location, and we moved it to Romsey Road, which is where the which is the red blob. So we got one year's worth of data, um, which is this year's worth of data, and uh, at year to date, we were getting a level of um, 20 micrograms annual mean standard for for VAT, which is a lot lower than we expected. And I'll come on to an explanation as to why we think that in a minute. Uh, these are the NOx tubes that are spotted around the city. So there's a lot more of those. Um, again, this is just sort of like overall trends, downward trend taking place. You can see I'm not going to focus on any particular line there. It just illustrates that there has been a downward trend and that in, in 2021 we were compliant in all locations. Um, but what I have done is I focused on the top four um, sites, uh, NOx tube sites um, in the air quality management area, which all happen to be on Romsey Road. Uh, so you'll see from that, that slide there that you have um, essentially you've got Romsey Road, Clifton Hill, uh, you've got Clifton Road, West End Terrace and um, Knights Quarter. Sorry, I'm struggling to read that myself. Um, and uh, all of these particular sites are on the um, the uh, upward uh, upward side of Romsey Road, so they're they're on the the left hand side as you're going up the hill. The uh, the green blob is again. I've just superimposed the static air quality monitoring station onto the same slide, just to illustrate where that sits on, on that scale. And you can see that it is quite a bit lower. And the reason is it's on the right hand side. In other words, the downward carriageway. Uh, and you might not think this to be that significant, but if you can imagine that vehicles traveling down the hill are cruising, so they're not under any sort of uh, burden to clamber up the hill, um, that affects their, their emissions output. Whereas obviously you flip them around, they're going up the hill on the, the, the left-hand side of the carriageway, they're under, they're under burden, they're climbing the hill, they're under load, and therefore their emissions are a lot higher. So we, we, we're treating that situation with a degree of caution at the moment. Uh, these are the district NOx tubes. Again, won't spend too much time on this, but there are eight of those around the district and they all show significant compliance with statutory levels. Um, the, the top line um, kind of looks greyish on the top screen there is actually Kingsworthy. Um, that is we're, gonna, we're, we're looking to review how we um, continue our monitoring in the district, simply as, as Councillor Porter said, it is a bit of a time and resource for, for officers, both in, in, in deployment of the tubes collection and the actual monitoring costs. Um, so we are gonna review how we take that forward um, and we may well pare down the number of sites that we're gonna look into going forward, simply because they're consistently showing compliance with those statutory standards. So the main points really that uh, I'd like to bring to the, uh, the committee's attention is um, that in terms of reviewing our air quality action plan, uh, current data shows that nitrogen dioxide compliance in all areas um, within the air quality management area, um, but there remains to be concern in terms of the Romsey Road impacts. Romsey Road is um, the hotspot, we are showing levels of around 36.5 micrograms per meter cubed annual mean standard for nitrogen dioxide. Um, to answer um, Councillor Wallace's question earlier about modelling um, variance and or accuracy, um, I can only say that uh, DEFRA's recommendation is that in order to um, be completely confident with compliance with statutory standards, you are expected to achieve a 10% confidence rate. In other words, if the standard is 40, you need to at least achieve 36. Okay, 36 or less in order to be confident with complying with the standard. Otherwise, they would, they would frown upon whether or not you have sufficient degree of confidence to undeclare on, on that area in terms of complying with the, stat, with the statutory standards. Um, at Romsey Road, we are around that. We're at 36 and a half micrograms per meter cube. So we're going to keep an eye on that that area. Um, although NOx levels remain well below pre-pandemic levels, there is that upward trend, so we've got a little bit of a caution there. Um, and as I said earlier, all district sites are compliant with the current nit nitrogen dioxide standards, 
albeit the highest levels are still in Kingsworthy at 25 micrograms per meter cubed. But all other sites are below, well below 21.4. So they are significantly below the 40 standard. So in terms of recommendations of the Air Quality Action Plan, we propose to retain the existing air QMA, um, but with uh, focus on targeted and deliverable actions on the Romsey Road area. And in terms of targeted and deliverable, we need to do a little bit of extra work on that, um, but it would be um, taking the shape of obviously reduced, um, reduced traffic overall, which, which relies on our movement strategy that was uh, mentioned earlier, focusing on whether or not we can um, reduce levels of HGV um, traffic at high traffic periods of the day is another example. Um, focus on static sources of nitrogen dioxide and PM particulates, i.e. boiler systems in people's homes, which we are, are already trying to deliver through the um, supplementary planning document, the air quality supplement SPD that we've adopted. Uh, and I'm sure there will be further suggestions as we look into that in more detail. Um, we propose to review the data, the tw this year's data, 2022's data, um, we're not through that yet, obviously, and we are required to submit a um, what is called an annual status report to DEFRA each year, and we have to do that by June. Um, so we'll have a much better position in the spring to understand where we are from last year's data. Uh, and uh, to belt and brace our position, we also want to have a look at another year's worth of data as well, as well 2023 data. And clearly, if the, the trends are that we are still well below the, um, the statutory standard, then we would potentially look or consider looking at revocation of our management area. So that's, that's really where we are in terms of the current air quality action plan. We mentioned earlier about the adoption of local, um, bespoke local targets for Winchester. I know the, um, Council are, are really keen to um, support further further improvements based around the WHO's uh, more stringent air quality standards, which came out last year, their air quality guidelines. And you can see on that slide in front of you that those are set out with interim targets, one, two, three, and four. There's no dates to those interim targets, because as you might imagine, it's a world document. And so we're all in very different place in terms of our air quality. Whilst we can certainly improve, we are we are not Beijing. Um, let's be let's be honest. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, so other areas have got have got uh, a lot further to go than we have. So these are interim targets, and we set out where we want to be locally against those those target areas. Um, and, uh, and 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 our position on striving for. Um, Better air quality for Winchester's residents also sits with the um, uh, local air quality management policy guidance document 22 issued by the government last year, sorry, this year, earlier this year, which, which is basically challenges all local authorities without an air quality management area to have an air quality strategy setting out how they continue to improve air quality within their districts. Um, so to identify what we believe to be appropriate air quality targets for us at Winchester. And what we what we mean by appropriate air quality targets are targets that are deliverable. Crack on, okay, sorry. Um, it, it's within the aspirational five year life of, of a plan, i.e. before 2027. Um, and we've, we asked them to um, look at four scenarios based on the three parameters of nitrogen dioxide, PM10s and finer particulates, PM2.5s. And the four scenarios were baseline, i.e. no change, do nothing scenario, um, a 5% reduction in traffic, a 10% reduction in traffic, and a 50% conversion of buses to electric. And the following slides, and I will very quickly canter through these because time show where we sit. Um, so the, the initial tall blue line is, is the 2019 equivalent, so the real monitored levels. So for nitrogen dioxide in Romsey Road, we had a level of 46.3 annual mean. 
uh, the do nothing scenario by 2027 um, suggests on basis of the modeling is that we would retrieve 25.5, 5% um, 24.9, <coughs> excuse me, 10% uh, 24.2 and 24.3 for 50% buses. So um, the WHO interim two target is our probable aspiration. In other words, if we do nothing, we'll still achieve that. If we want to achieve the um, WHO interim three target aspirational, we're going to have to do quite a bit more. We are going to have to achieve at least a 10% traf traffic reduction plus a 50% EV bus fleet um, uh, deliverable um, and possibly more. And we would need to do quite a bit more of extra work to try and achieve that, that level three target. Similarly, in a um, four PM tens, uh, 2019 level 29.5. Um, our probable level is WHO interim three, um, and we would achieve that if we did nothing. Um, our aspirational, uh, in order to achieve an aspirational target, the the final um, air quality guideline target for um, under WHO standards. Um, we would really, really struggle to achieve that by 2027, even if we had a 10% traffic reduction and 50% EV bus fleet delivery. So you can see that in 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 trying to meet the final WHO type WHO target in that parameter, we would have a lot of work to do. Hence, what level of risk we as a local authority want to uh, want to take on this. And then finally, in PM 2.5, this is quite an interesting one because these levels are a lot lower because it's a much finer particulate. Um, and uh, 2019, we had a, a level of 12.7. Even if we do nothing, had a 5% traffic reduction of 10% or 50% bus fleet, it makes very, very little difference to 2.5. And one of the reasons for that, or the main reason for that, is that PM 2.5, being a fine particulate, is significantly affected by out of district sources. So going back to what we were talking about earlier about um, the uh, the port and the port traffic, the cruise, the cruise terminals, um, they are a significant emitter of fine particulates. So not only this is where climate change and public health come to, come together. If they can uh, if they can hook up at the port, if we can have sufficient grid resilience to uh, power what are effectively small towns every time they, they dock up on the side, um, that will actually help our PM 2.5 levels all the way up here in Winchester, just by way of example. Nearly done. Um, so main points really are that uh, we will achieve probable but not aspirational WHO targets in all three parameters by 2027. If we want to achieve the aspirational, we've got some work to do. Um, and uh, no matter what we do, we won't likely achieve the aspirational PM 2.5 target on our own. So that will have to be achieved through a regional approach with other local authorities and, and really at a national level. Um, it's all about everybody doing a little bit to help the bigger picture when it comes to 2.5s. And uh, the recommendation really from this is to explore the adoption of local future air quality strategies for us at Winchester, which seeks to deliver the probable air quality targets by 2027. Thank you for that comprehensive. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, thank you for your usual very competent and thorough report. I remember last year's as well. Um, questions. I've got a couple of questions. Firstly, on your graphs, the, the um, plotting is very granular, like annual, um, but we all know that air quality is up and down on a daily, if not uh, hourly basis, especially in the summer when you've got high pressure systems. And all that. How granular do we measure the fluctuations on that annual average point that you put on there on a daily basis that may take over the levels, is my first question. Second question is you've got an action station around Romsey Road and uh, it's focused on improving air quality on Romsey Road. You talked about needing to uh, alter the traffic flow effectively. What's the time frame doing that on? Are you relying on something like this? 
two very good questions, if I may say. So in terms of granularity, as I, as I said, we have those two um, um, static air quality monitoring stations. They, they, they measure 50 minute averages of air quality, so they're, they're, they're very accurate. The only reason we report on the annual average is because that is the parameter. There are two parameters that local authorities are required to report on. <coughs> they are the um, hourly exceedances of the standard uh, and the annual uh, exceedances of the standard. And we have not breached the, an the hourly standards. Um, you're allowed, I think it's 18 breaches of the hourly standards per annum. Um, and we haven't breached those in the last two or three years. So the, the, those, those short-term peak levels are the standards are way above what we are experiencing in Winchester. Um, you can get, we can, we can provide um, like histogram reports of daily air quality levels if, you, if, if anybody would like to see them. But obviously, if you think about that on a daily basis, that's a, that's a very busy graph that you'll get very quickly. Um, and uh, in, in terms of, I think that answers that question. Yep. Uh, and in terms of time frames on delivering any traffic management solutions for Romsey Road, you are correct. Um, there is a lot of um, deliverability through the air quality action plan that relies on the movement strategy. Um, there, are, there are certain levers that can be pulled potentially declaring clean air zones. I think we, we touched upon those uh, earlier or specific road layouts so you can actually prevent um, certain classes of vehicles from driving down certain roads at certain times of the day uh, and the suggestion being that during the, the, the traffic peaks they're not as bad as they used to be in terms of commuter traffic so our, our all of, of understood thing is we've got um, ourselves as a public body, you've got the county, there's a lot more home working that there used to be. Understanding there's still a peak, less a peak. If we were to uh, focus on those periods of the day, you could potentially limit HGVs um, from traveling down those routes. We have a degree of control ourselves as well because those routes are trafficked by uh, park and ride um, buses. So they're currently Euro 6 do better and we could adopt electric park and ride buses which would significantly help so it's not it's not the number of vehicles per se it's the number of journeys that's relevant when it comes to air quality you can have the same vehicle traveling up the same route multiple times a day it's the number of the number of times that vehicle goes up and down that route that's relevant so even a small number of ev buses could have quite a Thank you. Just to, just to come back on the, the yeah. um, clearly Romsey Road does have. You have to focus on Romsey Road. Um, is is and is there any benefit, or are we able to issue any uh, advice to our residents if on a summer's day we believe the air quality will be less good in that road? Because some people do have breathing problems and whatever, and they might be worthwhile actually providing that that level of indication. You can get it on your Google happen whatever um, and second just for inf information for you um, then there is a proposal to put a new crossing on Romsey Road at the bottom end and that will result in more traffic stopping and pulling away which will impact, impact the air quality. Can I just is. add actually the reason that the air quality monitor is actually on the downside is because there isn't room on the upside Actually, if we could get everybody to walk on the downside, they would be healthier. But there isn't a footway all the way down the downside. So actually, getting people to walk on the downside would actually be a significant improvement for them. That's the sort of dramatic decision to make. And at the moment, we have a demand for a stop for vehicles, which I can tell you that we have some frequent conversations about but that is part of the challenge of this um, and we also know that we've made a commitment really that every electric vehicle that comes along the first place it's going to go is down Romsey Road up Romsey Road actually 
I don't mind what comes down so much as the up. <laughs> but it, it just shows that that difference is there because it's the most dramatic of all the roads. And St George's Street has been really is much better than that. But David might have another view than that. But I, I just think it's it could be a dramatic decision of saying, OK, we move all the footway to the downside. I've got nothing. I've, I, I don't have a different view. I mean, I, I, the, the, the system that you're referring to is a system called Air Alert, and um, a lot of London boroughs, London local authorities, do use that. Um, we have talked about using that here at Winchester. However, because we don't breach that hourly um, standard, um, there's been a lot of conjecture about whether or not we therefore use Air Alert, and we cause concern within our local population as to whether or not they're going to, you know, going to die if I go out today, which is not the case. I think I, th I think it's about empowering uh, local residents that may have um, pulmonary bronchial issues um, that they might not want to go out today. Um, but I wouldn't want to cause alarm by making them think that we are breaching the standard because we're, we're still not breaching the standard. So it, it, it's, a, it's a bit of a Bears further discussion, and in terms of the crossing, you've hit the nail on the head. Um, air quality and congestion are not good, good pals at all. Uh, and if you cr if you put anything in the way of smooth flow of traffic, generally you get a negative impact on air quality in that locality, especially if they're having to stop on a hill and then touch control, pulling away, over revving, all of that that takes place in that kind of situation. Thank you. Councillor Cook. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to highlight, obviously, because we've been speaking a great deal about Romsey Road and it being a hot spot, and that the problem is, is actually going up the hill. I think, I, um, please don't quote me on these percentages, but there's probably, most of the cars that are on the road these days have a facility called Stop Start. So when the car is stationary, the car stops. Now, there are still cars out there that don't have that. So what I would be suggesting, if it's possible to do this, and this is more of a statement than a question, or why can't it be done, is why can we not put signage going up the hill on Romsey Road that encourages the, res the motorist, when they are stationary, to turn off their engine and not to idle? my question please because that'd be a very quick way to deal with something yeah but you've got to still if the main pollution comes from when you accelerate and that's you can't change that so i think it's a really interesting uh, comment because different cars are acting in different ways now aren't they and perhaps that's something we could look at um the way in which we we're looking at that going forward because there are all sorts of issues with that. There's a, great, a much greater uptake of electric cars than everybody was expecting. Um, there is the poss possibility of electric vehicles for waste. We're, we've agreed we're going to go and talk to SCAS about their ambulances because they're probably making progress towards an electric fleet. And of course, there's also the, the problem of the railway underneath. Um, and there is also the design of any building because further away and the more the less of a cavern they create, the better it is. So there's a lot to be discussed still for Romsey Road, which actually, once we've learned that good practice, we should be able to use elsewhere. Speed is another one. So um, I definitely think that's, it's not to be discounted without consideration. Thank you. That's about that. Thank you very much. Uh, as a new councillor, a very interesting uh, sort of uh, insight into uh, what we're doing in terms of air quality. Um, I'd just like to refer to um, a, the um, uh, district NOx tube uh, map, uh, which shows uh, from 2017 um, a significant reduction, uh, particularly in uh, Kingsworthy, where it seems to have gone down by at least half. Um, is there a particular reason for not just that uh, in terms of the reduction, but uh, the other reductions other than um, uh, COVID and the, the, the sort of uh, reduction in traffic that was uh, taking place then? I think the Kingsworthy ones, because the dirty great big wall, 
that was actually creating the cavern effect got knocked down. It's not being rebuilt, to be absolutely honest. But also, because of COVID, there's a lot less traffic at those junctions. It was at Martyrworthy, was at, at the junction of the Cotton Hall. That was, it's always been high and smelly, but it's, it's better since COVID. Um, and the people haven't gone back in that sense. Um, the others have all had that drop as well, um, consistently. And the, the peak time is more spread out now. The other issue, isn't it? They're, they're, going, they're going to work, but over a longer period of time. But that's why we're interested in working how we can help parishes to enable them to be aware of this as well. And also, just to say, we, we, you know, the probable target is a lower target than the AQMA target. But actually, we're never going to cease until we get down to those other targets, as low as we can get for winter. Indoors and outdoors. Hi. Quick. Just, I was just interested in the trains, David. Our network rail sort of encouraging trains to be less diesel and less part. The other thing was the wearing of masks, because obviously masks can trap out and about. Is that is that a help for people who are asthmatic? Take the second question first. I think it depends on the, the the type and nature of the mask that you're wearing. Obviously, if you're wearing a very high spec mask, uh, an occupational mask, then it will it's, it's designed to keep the particulates out. If you're just wearing a cloth mask, which would allow fine particulates through then it could well trap them in the mask and, and give you worse problems. And it's worth also saying that air quality inside the cab of the vehicle that you are driving is almost always worse than it is outside. So uh, bringing in air as you're driving along and it's effectively concentrating it within the cab. A lot of people know that. So if you apply that theory to a mask, it's, yeah, it's like making it a bit worse. Um, I forgot what the first question was now. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd have to get back to you on that one. Um, I th I, yeah, uh, I mean, certainly more and more of the rail line or the rail network is becoming electrified. Um, so there is a move away from diesel engines. Um, is, is, Great, we think yeah, it's not. Yeah, it's, it's, the, it's the, the heavy duty, it's more muscle to carry the load, if you like, that diesel so I think passionate traffic I can certainly find out yep All right thank you Dave um, I think you're very content now and I'm conscious of the time so thank you very much Dave and Councillor Falter for this very interesting bit of work we look forward to seeing the main report later in the year Thank you very much and thank you to Mr Ingram for this very comprehensive report, report written in form that hopefully you can all understand. All right, now we come on to the last item, one, community infrastructure levy. While uh, Corinne's coming to the table, I'd just like to introduce this briefly before Corinne Phillips talks through the slides. Um, the aim of these slides is really to take you through the history and use of SIL from 2014 to this day. Don't worry, it doesn't take long, they're quite short. But we had expected SIL to be replaced by ill in 2022. Infrastructure levy. Sorry. So we'd like to revise the SIL strategy for 2023. And um, there are some questions for you to consider. But actually what today we're seeking your approval is to revise the SIL strategy to discuss the SIL, mem SIL process uh, progress as we've got mem with members as a working party and then come back to the committee in March with a revised strategy. I've got counts uh, for this. So a few words. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. While we're waiting to be kicked back in, say, oh, do we want to come over? Yeah. Thanks, Jay. Um, right. Uh, still funding the 
key contributor to improving infrastructure across the district. For example, Sill was key to the Winchester Sport and Leisure Park, the Sports Pavilion, and the Winchester Flood Alleviation Scheme. However, going forward, any changes to the scheme across the whole district? Since 2014, over £8 million of SIL funding has been collected in Winchester. Another £8 million collected in the southern areas. By this, I mean the five most southern wards of Bishop's Waltham, Central Mayon Valley, Whiteley and Shedfield, Southwark and Wickham, and Denmead. However, whilst 80%, 87% of the SIL collected in Winchester has already been allocated to projects in Winchester, only 26% of SIL funding collected in the southern wards has so far been allocated to the area. Most of that was the proportion that went straight to the parish councils. The purpose of SIL is to provide new infrastructure to support our growing communities. As members are aware, there's been a massive amount of house building in the southern area over the past 10 years. So it's critical that any updates to the scheme recognize the recent disparity in dispersion of SIL funding. Use this as an opportunity to correct that anomaly. It's getting late. The second, the second point I would like to make is on how the funding is allocated. Um, the council, obviously, we talked earlier about um, tackling the climate emerg emergency and creating a greener district. The SIL funding represents a fantastic opportunity for following through on this objective, whatever the project's chosen. However, obviously, this objective would be particularly best achieved through projects that can directly impact our carbon footprint, such as in improvements to cycling and walking infrastructure. And obviously, I would be happy to support any working groups on SIL project allocations. Thank you. Being very rude, but I send me that. I'll listen. Okay, yeah. just that um, Colin's got her whole thing off the screen. So we're just trying to deal with that, but I'd be... Thank you very much. And uh, yes, that's exactly why we're doing the review. Um, but we have been trying hard to spend money. In, um, and actually, it's done them a favour because we've done really big things. But that's why we want the review. <laughs> All right, we appear to have a little bit of a technical hitch. So can we refer to our papers on this? And you just walk us through the papers. Sorry about that, Every, everybody. My laptop seems to have completely given up. I've just got a blank screen. But if I if I go through the papers, if everybody's got those, um, with just a little bit of background to SIL, um, we have been operating it now for nine years. Uh, and during that time, we've collected over 20 million. And I did check recently, and it's actually gone over 21 million. Um, We've actually retained 15 million of that uh, to spend on infrastructure schemes. Um, and there is a range of, of schemes that, that the money can be spent on, recreation, transport, flood defences. And in actual fact, we've spent quite a lot on the first three of those things on the slides. Um, but we're, we've been kind of exploring how much we can actually support the health system at the moment, because obviously there are um, implications there for development. Um, the SIL charging rates that we have are actually index linked. So even though they were brought in in 2014, they have gone up every single year. And we are due some new um, index linked rates in January. So the, the, the slides that you have in there of the SIL charging rates um, show in brackets what we originally collected and what they've actually gone up to. And they are broadly comparable with other districts in Hampshire. Um, Obviously, there are different zones, um, one being Winchester Town. Um, there's obviously the market towns and rural areas. And also, we have South Hampshire, which is zero rated because the major development areas are zero rated because most of the infrastructure there is, is provided as part of the development. So 
um, we've got three things to basically consider. One was the possibility of, of reviewing the SIL rates. Um, the second is reviewing what's called the infrastructure list, because when SIL was brought in, the council also had to create uh, an infrastructure list to actually show that, that SIL was required. Um, it's quite a long study done as the, the, via, the financial viability and on the list there were some very big ticket items like the M3, Junction 9 and really we need to review that to make it more in line with the council priorities. So that list which was originally called the R123 list but is now called the infrastructure list really needs to be reviewed um, to see how we can take schemes forward because it is a very broad brush. It, it doesn't stop things being done because we have very broad headings on that list. But I think we do need to be to what we can provide moving forward. So uh, as, as well as the SIL charging rates, I think we, we were thinking of looking at the infrastructure list needs to be looked at. And um, the kind of last thing that we need to look at is the criteria that we use for awarding SIL funding. Um, uh, and so they, those are the three broad areas that, that what we're hoping to do is, is have a working group that involves members uh, and look at those three broad brushes. As I say, the, the SIL charging rates have gone up every year and also with the government's levelling up and regeneration bill, SIL is likely to be changed um, to the infrastructure levy, which will operate slightly differently. Um, at the moment, we collect SIL more or less when the development starts and at the, at the early stages, and we think that the infrastructure levy will be collected once properties are sold. So we're not sure on the detail of that at the moment, but obviously there's going to be a change there, and we will need to look at what rates we charge when that comes in. So at, at the moment, um, the SIL charging rates, are, we, we all think, might go up quite significantly next year because they are linked to construction costs. Um, so, um, but obviously that's that's something that we need to take into account when we when we um, look at whether or not we do up, uplifting the rates. Um, so that's basically the the need for the kind of refreshment of SIL. Um, just to kind of recap quickly, is is the infrastructure list needs updating whether or not we need to review the SIL charges at this stage, bearing in mind that we will have the levelling up and regeneration bill that will change that, and also the criteria that we use when we do have bids for funding for SIL, SIL money. So what, what we're hoping to do is, is have a, a working group to look into those three broad areas um, and come back to this committee at a later stage um, with a report with, with those findings. So. Um, Yes, apologies that the presentation didn't work. <laughs> I hope I've kind of encapsulated that. Um, Councillor Porter. That was comprehensive, bearing in mind you were struggling at the beginning. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. Have we had any questions, Councillor Cook? Thank you, Chair. Um, you referred um, in, to, a, would that be a cross-party group that you would be referring to? Yes. Right, that come from different places. Great, because I think it's excellent. Thank you. Any further questions, Councillor Pearson? Two questions. Uh, I'll make them quick and very brief. First, the national park area. Um, some of the parishes there are getting difficulty in receiving CIL funding. Is this because they're in the national park? Um, yes, the national park does operate its own um, SIL uh, system. Um, I know that they have lots of bids that come in every year. I don't know how much money they set aside, but certainly I know that obviously they, they cover a much broader area. Um, so they have an awful lot of bids to consider, not just from Winchester District. Uh, and, and I think that has been a slight problem for them to actually have enough money to, to fund various schemes. And, and, and Councillor Pearson, please Sorry. remember that the money follows the building and the National Park does not build as much. So, yeah. 
but where are there where there are parishes yeah so where there are parishes where they are in part and part most of those use both methods uh, Wyford is an example of um, so some do seek money from both sides Mike please a development uh, the second question is is a more difficult one I think and that is uh, effectively CIL is a development tax how much is this impacting on the cost of housing um, that's a difficult one to quantify I mean obviously when it was brought in there was a study an independent study was done on the financial viability to make sure that it was financially viable to, to, to charge sale um, I mean, not, not all councils do charge. Eastleigh doesn't have SIL at all, and Basingstoke charges quite a lot more. So, um, but in actual fact, if you look at how house prices have risen over the last few years, uh, you know, obviously when you get a builder that, that comes in, and we've had this at um, South Wanston, you know, we, we collect around about 11 to 12,000 per, per kind of three bedroom detached house. And when you think that the cost of in Winchester is probably 700,000, it's actually not a huge amount of, of that. So um, I don't think we've had builders yet that have said, you know, we're going out of business because of because of SIL. My own parish, a uh, million pound house has been built, replacing houses that were built for less than 300,000. Can I interject there as well? Because actually it is... A it is about uh, producing infrastructure for those people that live in those houses to use. So we often hear the public say, oh, we get lots more houses, but we don't get the infrastructure. But actually, that's what this is designed to address. So it's right that those houses have a levy, the infrastructure that we all expect as a group. Thank you. Next time, can we switch our mic on more often? <laughs> Councillor um, Pearson, I'm going to write you a little note, in a little yellow post-it note. And every time you speak, it will say, when you want to speak, put your mic on, please. <laughs> <laughs> I think that uh, my experience of the SIL has been very good. And I think that the projects that have granted SIL money uh, are judged on their merit, not on their position in the count in the count uh, district. So I'd just like to make that point um, on that. I think it's, uh, we're, we're conscious that the council plan has changed slightly. Um, we're being much more assertive about trying to reduce our carbon footprint mm. and this is an opportunity to look at money that we have in through this method how we achieve our communities achieve that reduction in carbon footprint they want to see but there are other priorities that other people may wish to add in as well and we need to look at that and it's an opportunity to do that now yeah any further comments no so thank you very much for a good presentation. The printed sheets were wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> we will have to come back with you to you with the timetable for the working party. Yes. Um, we will receive the updated fees uh, towards the end of January. So we will know a little bit more then. We would like to for our the opportunity for members of this community this uh, committee to be part. That'd be good. Appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, now we just move on to the last part of the meeting, which is the working party. Uh, so the next meeting we've got Council Homes Refit Programme, the air quality management update.
infrastructure levy review and the registered district use provision. If I may, Chair, you've also got a speaker coming from the Southern, Wall, Water. Southern Water. Thank you. Natural England. Natural England, yes. sorry. It was Natural England coming. Oh, Natural England. England. Yes. Yeah. Hi. Not Southern Water. Southern Water's invited, Natural England have accepted, so Southern Water are yet to accept. I apologise, I did get that wrong earlier. Excellent. So that concludes the meeting for this evening.